Ready to roll? Yes, sir. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you all to the Tuesday, August 20th, 2013th Board of Supervisors meeting. We will begin our meeting with a flag salute led by the 5th District Supervisor, Supervisor McCumber. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Will we, the clerk please read the statement of meeting procedures. Welcome to the Placer County Board of Supervisors meeting of Tuesday, August 20th, 2013. Agendas are available on the wall outside this meeting room. If you are here to speak on an issue not appearing on the agenda, you may do so during the public comment period. There's a three to minute time limit per speaker. The board is not permitted to take action on items addressed under public comment. When you speak, clearly state your name and address for the record. All items on the agenda will be open for the public to address before final action is taken. There's a three minute time limit per speaker, which will be monitored by a timer on the podium. If there is a person speaking on behalf of a group with no other testimony from another member of the group, please identify yourself as such and your time may be extended at the pleasure of the board. Keep in mind that the chairman has the discretion of limiting the total discussion time on any item. If you are hearing impaired, we have listening devices available. It is requested that cell phones be either turned off or put in the silent mode. Thank you for your participation and cooperation. Thank you, Ann. Uh, before we move to public comment, I want to announce that we have a supplemental agenda. Uh, this is a county executive, uh, the county budget. Uh, I want to add it to the agenda after item six, the Board of Supervisors minutes to approve minutes of July 23rd, 2013. Okay. And this is our final budget, uh, not our final budget, but budget. Now is the time for public comment. Is there anyone here that wishes to address the board on any item that is not on the agenda? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning to all of you. Uh, Bev Anderson, 28320, Secret Town Court, Colfax, California, 95713. Uh, as chair of the 211 Placer Steering Committee, I'm sure that uh, to, I'm here to ask you to put your uh, vote for your endorsement of 211 on the agenda as soon as possible. We're, your very next meeting would be greatly appreciated. We need this to be able to go, on, go forward. We are in a good position for a sizable grant, which would be helped greatly by your vote that, we, that you have indicated you're willing to do. Getting the last pieces in and submitting the application is vital to obtaining grants to make Placer's connection with 211 statewide possible. We know that Placer County's budget is tight. We're not asking for any funding. We'd delight, be delighted if Placer County can participate in funding this, this service, but we can keep going and not launch until we have the funding assigned wherever we can find it. And where we find the funding, we can, when it's fine, finally in, we can launch. And since we started in May thir on May 13th, 2011, Shasta, Butte, Tehama, and Humboldt have launched or are approved and getting ready to launch. We'd like to move forward in, like they have and get to the place where we actually have 211 in Placer County. Thanks. Thank you, Bev. Anyone else wish to address the board? Morning. Good morning, board members. My name is Lori Lewis. I reside at 6245 Wise Road, Newcastle, California. I have a statement and then I have two questions. This is going back to the Wise Villa approval for his um, restaurant that we had come before the board. I'd like to update the board on what's currently happening. I have um, filed a complaint with code enforcement regarding Mr. Grover Lee's Wise, U Wise Villa Winery because now he's operating as a restaurant. Um, he has illegal A-frame signs um, saying that he's a bistro and he's open for lunch and dinner. I thought when he came before the board, he portrayed that he was going to do food and wine pairings. 
Now he's operating as a restaurant. So my two questions are, how are you going to deny Mr. Carson to open up his coffee shop slash Starbucks, and how will you deny me a franchise for a fast food place if I sell grape juice? This is um, concerning because if we allow this to continue, it's going to open the doors for other unregulated, improperly zoning areas in the ag situation. I don't know if you guys are aware of that, but um, I did write a formal complaint to code enforcement, and I'll attach that to the. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. <laughs> Anyone else wish to address the board under public comment? Mr. Lease. Thank you. Well, when I was here last time, I actually may take a step back and say, my name is Stephen Lease, and very soon you'll know my title. Um, when I came before the board last month, uh, it was on behalf of Plaster Arts as their chair. Uh, during that time period, towards the end of it, I was asked a question about cookies. <laughs> and I have become known as the cookie guy around the area. And I have made for each one of you one of my homemade chocolate chip cookies. I have served over 20,850 as of this morning. I made those this morning for you. And as you already know, I make them and give them away to groups as a donation. For example, Relay for Life just received some. Uh, the Seroptimus uh, group requested them, and then they sold them as a donation to their group in Relay for Life this past weekend. Done that for many different groups like Rotary. We'll continue to do that. I have a goal of serving over 100,000 cookies or said a little bit differently, serving 100 million, or excuse me, serving a million morsels to those in our community. From that, uh, it comes from living every day to the fullest, building relationships for tomorrow, and helping others with no expectation of anything in return. I hope that everyone in our county lives by that same you know, ideal and that we make it an incredible place to live and do and grow and uh, raise our families. So. With that, enjoy the cookies. If you are not eating the cookies for one reason or another, please use it as a way to pay it forward. Take it as a thank you to someone who has done something for you recently and just say thank you. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else wish to address the board under public comment? Good morning, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the board. Um, I uh, want to take this opportunity to provide the board with an update on the American fire. Uh, but before I introduce um, uh, the current incident commander for the fire, uh, Rocky Obliger, uh, what I'd like to do is just comment um, on the cooperation, as usual, that we normally see from uh, the various departments that have uh, support and provide support in, in these types of incidents. In particular, uh, with uh, all of the smoke issues that we've been dealing with, uh, the Air Pollution Control District, as well as uh, uh, Dr. Burton. Um, I do want to make a quick shout out to the Forest Hill community. That community is significantly impacted once again um, uh, from a very, very large influx of firefighters fighting fires. Um, and uh, quite frankly, um, uh, as always, very proud to go through that community and, and see the support that that community provides to the firefighters from all over the country uh, that come in to, to help our communities. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge uh, uh, the Tahoe National Forest uh, Supervisor Tom Quinn is here, also uh, Fire Chief Brad Harris. Uh, and Rocky, without further ado, I'll hand over to you, sir. Good morning. Uh, again, Good morning. my name is Rocky O'Plager. I'm the incident commander for California National Team 4, and I'm incident commander for one of the 16 U.S. national teams. And as we know, the severity we see not only in California and the western United States, you know, I'm honored to be back in Forest Hill. I, I wish I was for a different search a situation. I was here on the Ralston fire with this team. And uh, again, I have to commend the cooperation and relationships. Even with Placer County yesterday, we had a, situ a situation with a a dozer that uh, and transport that uh, got was compromised and went off the road. Uh, we went, con contacted Public Works. They immediately uh, initiated getting us a crane, and we were able to extract that with safety and to no injuries to the folks. So I want to give you a brief of the fire. The fire is approximately just under 15,000 acres. It's at 14,990. Uh, we're at 54 percent containment. 
And that containment was the efforts beginning from the initial attack. Again, the cooperation of the agency, certainly the Sheriff's Office, the National Forest, uh, CAL FIRE, we, we've not been successful where we are today without that cooperation. So I'm just going to give you a real brief on the fire of where we are today. Uh, as you know, that country is extremely uh, difficult terrain, steep terrain, and with the weather that we've had and that we're still going to get for the next couple of days with numerous lightning fires, the potential for winds, the folks are making an incredible effort. And we're proud to say that the safety record is outstanding. We've had some minor injuries, bruises, nothing significant to this date. And currently we have just over 1,800 firefighters on the incident. Starting at the very south end to give some reference. Uh, obviously our concerns working real close with CAL FIRE and the Sheriff's Office and the forest is the community of Michigan Bluff, surrounding communities. The fire has worked its way down and is trying to get into the North Fork, and, uh, the, west, the North Fork, the West Fork of the American River. Uh, previous history shows that if it gets in there well established, it'll want to try to work its way around and it's a major impact to the communities and eventually Forest Hill. Our efforts have been able to hold it along Deadwood Ridge uh, and currently crews in very steep terrain are trying to button up the very south end of this fire to prevent it from f uh, spreading further south. In coordination with CAL FIRE, Brad was able to give us resources. We have built contingency lines, worst case scenario. Uh, we've looked at even potentially tying into old fire scars like the Ralston fire. We're hoping not to have to do that, but we have that in place based on what the fire does to us. Uh, our, high, our highest success is on the north end. The fire wanted to continue to back down into the North Fork of the American River. That's a major concern. If it crosses the North Fork, previous history shows it will go and affect major impact of the I-80 corridor and would make significant runs. Uh, yesterday we were successful able to contain that. Uh, we have crews in there uh, uh, with water and the black line you showed down there, the crews were able to hold it and we feel very confident both looking at infrared detection, uh, both folks with handhelds on the ground and from the air show that there's little to no heat left in that north end and will continue to be tenacious to prevent that from further spread. Our last concern is the fire has established itself in three drainages. It's in the Antoine, uh, the uh, uh, screw auger, and the, what is that last one called? The Manila. And fire history has shown in the previous week that the fire wants to run to the northeast significantly. It's in perfect alignment to make those runs. With that, and we knew that in coordination with the forest and the cooperators, we built our contingency lines down towards Robinson Flat. Uh, we've taken a look at the road to bring it back into the, right in here to the uh, Star Town Plantation. We've got crews working that and completely secured that with low intensity fire. We've also coordinated with key private uh, timber companies on any potential impacts to that. Uh, the fire is going to potentially make significant runs. We're hoping with completion of the lines that we'll be able to utilize a firing operation, a lower intensity fire to push the fire back into itself so when the two meet it doesn't have chance to build significant runs. Uh, and so we're pretty confident uh, with the tactics that we're deploying uh, that we can be successful. We're you know a long ways away from getting there yet uh, but continue uh, resources and uh, diligence uh, we hope to reach our containment objectives. Thank you. Thank you. Is there someone else that was going to? Oh. Oh, okay. Any comments, uh, Jennifer? Um, Rocky, I know uh, last night at the uh, meeting in Forest Hill, the question came up about when um, a full containment is expected on this fire, and I, that's a question that I've heard again this morning. Could yes, you address that, please? Yeah, very good. Uh, you know, uh, when you look at containment, there's a lot of factors in there. Uh, one of them is critical resources. Uh, there's none available nationally. Uh, some of our critical resources are hand crews. Uh, we've been in negotiation with North Ops as our crews get to the point that they need to have their rest. There's some requirements on how long they can work. We're looking at what those replacements will be like. But currently, with all the best intel we got, again, working with the meteorologist specialists we have on the fire, our fire behavior analysts, the resources assigned, we're right now looking at September 1st as a full containment date. You know, anything before that uh, will be great. Uh, if we have windows of opportunity, the fire gives you uh, occasionally on that. Uh, even though we've had these storms, they've, we've been able to skirt us. We've had cooler temperatures, which has allowed us to get in and do more effective work. Uh, and I also want to commend the community. We had a very successful community meeting last night. It was standing room only. Uh, all the agencies were representative and certainly the forest and it was a good opportunity and I'm 
continue to be amazed by the incredible support that the community has given to the firefighters and the impact that we have done to the surrounding communities. Any other comments from board members? No? I just want to finish by uh, thanking uh, both uh, Tom Quinn and the uh, National Forest for all of the work that they're doing in cooperation with Placer County as well as uh, the incident management team. Um, uh, the cooperation with the incident management team has been superb as usual. Um, lastly, I do want to introduce John McEldowney, uh, the new program manager for OES. He's, he's sending you updates, uh, but uh, it's always good to put a face to a name. So uh, that's all that I have. All right. Thank you. And uh, to all you uh, that are on this uh, fire, we just want to express our immense gratitude to all the firefighters and people involved in getting this thing under control. We know it's a lot of hard work, and those uh, folks out there are really doing a great job. So we really appreciate it. Thank you. All right, uh, we're still under public comment, so anyone that uh, wants to come forward, good morning. <laughs> Hi again. Um, my name is Ann Sharpen. Uh, my daughter was diagnosed with prader willi syndrome when she was five years old. She's now 42. prader willi syndrome is a very difficult syndrome to manage. Providing support to a person with this disability is not an easy job that can be done by an inexperienced worker. This job requires a motivated, self-starting person who is capable of redirecting and de-escalating severe behaviors. This job requires a, mo a motivated, self-starting person who is capable of redirecting uh, and can, will enable them to handle de uh, dangerous situations. Uh, Teresa lives in a supported living services program and needs to be monitored by her workers at all times at home, at work, and in the community to make sure she does not procure additional food that is not spelled out in her restricted but well-balanced food plan. The inability of a worker to understand and implement these requirements could present a life-threatening situation for Teresa. With this kind of assistance from IHSS, Teresa is able to live the best possible life for her. This kind of dedication shown to the frail elderly and persons with disabilities is necessary and deserves a monetary reward. In-home supported services employs these dedicated people to work in the recipient's home, which provides a level of personal and compassionate care not found in an institution. This service allows the recipient to remain in their familiar environment, which is far more conducive to their well-being and health rather than a costly institution. All that these almost 2,000 workers are asking for is the recognition of a job well done and a raise of 70 cents an hour. This raise is well deserved. The providers have not had a raise for the last three years. And this raise would only cost the county approximately 11 cents an hour. Not only would this raise benefit the elderly, the handicapped, and the worker, but also the community by returning money back into the local econ economy. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. My name, good morning. My name is Monique Cardin, and I'm here with IHSS as well, and I would like to express my concerns about the less money that we are given and the money that we do need extra, the 70 cents. Um, for the caregivers that are there, they are stressed because of their finances are not being met, and it makes it hard for them to give the care for the recipient that they do so much deserve. They want to be on their own, and they want to be cared in their own homes. But it makes it very hard because we're trying to have the money available to us to get out to them. And my mother, I had come into the caregiving because I was laid off of my position as of February because I had to take care of her to take her back and forth to her doctor's appointments. And afterwards, when I received the money, I waited six months to be paid. But that's not as much as because of the fact um, the money, it was my mother, of course, I would take care of her first. But I do see that there is definitely a need, that we do need this extra money. As of now, I'm looking up for other work to be compensated with the money that I can make and can't make. And it makes it really hard. 
but um, today I just want to express my concern today that we should, it should be looked into, that we should get more money, the caregivers that go out and help others. Thank, Thank you. Good morning. Hello, good morning. My name is Vicki Corsi and I am one of 2,000 IHSS providers here in Placer County. Uh, I would like to tell you about two of my clients. Uh, Debbie was trying to stay, not be institutionalized. Uh, she was one of my clients who was paralyzed from the waist down in an automobile accident on Highway 80. When I met her, she was lying on a used hospital bed with no sheets on it in a very, on a very hot day in August of 2012. There was no food in the house, and I repeat, no food in the house. No dishes, no, n nothing. She couldn't walk, bathe herself, cook for herself, or clean her home. During the night, she would soil her bed. I would get her out of bed every morning and change her sheets, sheets daily, sheets that my family had given her. I would clean her up and change her clothes, prepare three meals a day, wash and dry her bedding daily, and clean her house. She had no one else to do this. Another one of my clients, Evelyn, injured both knees, her shoulder and spine. She is very depressed and has been diagnosed with bipolar. She has difficulty breathing, walking, and bathing herself. I clean her house, prepare all her meals, assist her with her breathing machine, and calm her down when she is very, very upset. We as providers care a great deal for our clients. We give quality care, time, and understanding for the less fortunate. We are asking for a 70 cent pay raise. I understand that it would only cost Placer County 11 cents of the 70 cents pay raise that we receive. I would like to say that I give back my money to Placer County. I would like to say that I live in Placer County and every bit of my paycheck is spent here. I shop at Bel Air, Rayleigh's, Grocery Outlet, Save Mart, Walgreens, and numerous stores in this area. I have my car repaired in Loomis. I buy gas in Auburn at Arco Station and pay taxes on my house. So P uh, Plaster County would not lose by increasing our wages. The housing market has improved and I understand that the real estate market prices have increased by 30%. All that I'm asking is that the Board of Supervisors put people first. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Rafalo, Yes, Jim Rafalo, 11191 Torrey Pines. It's an Auburn address, but I live in Lake of the Pines, unfortunately. Uh, first of all, forgive my attire. I hadn't intended to speak today, so, but uh, two things. One, um, Supervisor Holmes, I want to commend you. In the past, you've equated uh, mental health, health issues with public safety. We, we, I even did a column on that. And Supervisor Euler, I want to thank you because you keep an eye on the fiscal problem more than anybody else, and I'm not knocking anybody else, but he's, he's made that a crusade. The reason I'm here is twofold. One, to thank you for considering these things, because it's not easy to take X amount of dollars and try to spend them X, Y, Z. It's mathematically impossible. So what you've done in the past, believe me, we're grateful, and this is personal because my wife is an in-home health care service provider for our daughter and our son-in-law. Um, there's two dynamics at work here. One is the workers have had pay cuts in recent times. They've also had a dramatic cut in hours. And even though those hours are cut, the amount of care that they give hasn't been cut. They continue to provide the exact same service they provided before those hours were cut, and even more so. And Supervisor Euler, this, I think this is important to your philosophy. Because if they are not funded in the way it's currently funded now with, a, with the proposed raise, those people become wards of the county, of the state, and you will pay, and I'm pulling a figure out of error, but this is just from experience, you will pay twice, maybe three, maybe four times more than you're currently paying these workers now. So whatever you can do, and I know it's a difficult task, believe me, it will be appreciated. Thank you, Jim. Good morning. My name is Pamela Jones and I also am a provider. I retired in 2005 and crazy me went back to work six months later. I was bored. I took in caregiving with a 94-year-old retired Christian principal. 
Uh, her daughter moved her up from Bakersfield up to here. Um, I take care of her 24-7, which took three hours a day first. Then it went to 24-7. She has four caregivers, okay? I'm the main one. I've been with her for the past eight years. I also stay with her, okay, because she needs 24-hour care. I also take care of my brother for the last 11 years, who's in another county. I do that on weekends. Someone else takes care of him during the week. Yes, we are underpaid people. And yes, we do, like the gentleman said, we give it our all, our heart for these people. My client, Joe Bartell, says, when I take a day off, you've been gone too long. And I said, honey, I need a break. She goes, I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> but anyway, I ask that you accept our proposal as far as our 70 cent raise. It's not asking for a whole bunch. And whether we, you approve it or not, we're still going to be there for these people because we put them first. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, uh, supervisors. How are you? Good. My name is Edita Adams, and I am the uh, statewide president of United Domestic Workers of America. Uh, just to let you know, we representing 65,000 home care workers, and I am overseeing 11 counties. And I'm also a provider, and I care for my daughter. She was born 23 weeks premature, and it's been about 14 years that she's been in the in-home support services program. And I'm here today, and you hear from our, you know, co-workers uh, right here, there are not only a provider itself. These people who's working with disabled and elderly at home, they really are a good people. And they deserve a 70 cents wage increase. As I hear from them, we have only 2,000 members right here, meaning to say that we have more than 2,000 clients in their home, or they're taking care of their strangers that they didn't even know on how hard to be with them for 24 hours. They have overtimes. We don't have any overtimes, but we still have to do the work because these people is the same as we are here. We deserve a dignity and respect. I ask you to support the proposal. The other counties that I've been through they already had their contract settled. And it's, it's, I'm very, very proud of those Board of Supervisors of the American counties that they released their contract for my IHSS workers. Give Placer home care providers a fair livable wages, and I urge you to put people first. I truly appreciate your hard work in your county. This is a great county, a small county. It's easy to work with. Great people, and I love to be here. And I just want to hear when I come back that we already have the contract in place. Thank you so very much, and you have a great day. Thank you. Good morning, supervisors. My name is Mike Losa, and I'm the regional coordinator for the United Domestic Workers. Uh, what we have done today is we have, I think, painted the picture of a life of a home care provider and the dignity in which they do their job. We ask of you as Board of Supervisors to look at the impact of the lives that are helped by the work that they do, but also to look at the economic side of the impact. We've done some visits with uh, some Board of Supervisors and explained some of the uh, avenues of impact, of financial impact that is generated in each Board of Supervisor district. Uh, at your North Lake Tahoe uh, Board of Supervisor meeting, we presented some of them statistics and facts. Uh, and at our visits with you, supervisors, we've done the same thing. And this program is a program that generates 
funding. With wages that are increased, it adds more value to monies that are spent in the neighborhood, in the businesses, and in the tax for, for the county. And this is a win-win-win situation at very low cost to this county. We have been bargaining for quite a, quite a while, and it's time to put people first and to remember the importance of this program and the duties that you're obligated to perform as a public servant. I'm not here to hold you accountable for that. You're there to hold yourself accountable to that. And so I urge you, we've been at this a long time, and the proposals are zero, nothing. These home care providers don't have holiday pay. They don't have vacation pay. They don't have pensions. A very few of them receive health care. All the work that they did to generate community first choice option money, 300 and I think it was $360,000 to this county, they had a lot to do with that. It was through their lobbying efforts at the state and at the federal level that created this funding. And what a small request to utilize that to improve the lives for them and the people that they care for. The cuts that they've taken statewide are almost insurmountable for them. To have to decide whether to eat, put gas in your car, or pay a bill. I think I'm eating. So you know the, the financial impact that they're under. This uh, three years without a raise, it's because they sympathize with you when you came to them and said, you know what, we need a contract extension from you. They did it because of your request. Now it's time to consider their request. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to uh, suspend uh, public comment for a time being. We have two timed items that we're running behind. And uh, as soon as those timed items are over, we got a 9.15 and a 9.30. As soon as those are over, I will reopen public comment. So, Supervisor Montgomery, did you want to move forward with your 915 commendation? Yes, I would. And, and I see the Machados in the back. Bobby, uh, Shawnee, Gary, if you wouldn't mind coming forward. I know you might feel a little bit like salmon swimming upstream at the moment, but <laughs> if you wouldn't mind coming forward to the, uh, the podium here, we would very much appreciate it. I just called it the wrong thing again. What's it called, Jim? What? It's not a podium. Lectern. Lectern. Jim corrects me every time, so I figured I'd just jump the gun on that one. Thank you so much, and I apologize for the delay. We just never know what's going to happen under public comment. So, <clears throat> so I do have here um, a commendation for the Machado family and for Machado Orchards, um, and I will read this word for word and um, then would love an opportunity to hear from you all um, about what it means to you to be a, a working farm and a working business in Placer County, and then we'll, I think, take a couple pictures. So, uh, this is a commendation in the matter of Machado Orchards on their 90th year anniversary. Whereas in 1923, Joseph Machado arrived from the Azores Islands and purchased 17 acres of pear orchards in the Bowman area of Auburn, and whereas the Machados have had good times and bad along the way, including a blight that hit the pear orchards in the 1960s when the family lost, almost lost the ranch. They replanted, kept the surviving pear trees, filled in with apples, peaches, plums, and nectarines. And whereas Gary Machado added to the acreage in the 1970s, and in 1980, Gary and his mother Bobby opened the store, not long after, Machado Orchards started selling their signature pies using Bobby's recipes. The rest is history. Machado Orchards has expanded to include a wide variety of pies, including cherry, peach, pear, plum, and nectarine, mixed berry, blueberry, boysenberry, raspberry, marionberry, and the cream pies, chocolate, banana, and coconut. I'm getting hungry just thinking about this. Um, they introduced sugar-free pies five years ago. 
And whereas on a typical weekday, they make and sell 200 pies, and on weekends, three to 400 pies, on Thanksgiving, they make and sell 4,000 pies, with another 2,500 to 3,000 pies flying off the shelves during the Christmas holiday. And whereas the store also sells a variety of jams, jellies, honey, nuts, pickled items, and whatever is fresh produce in season from the garden, and whereas the Machado family contributes to the community. Shawnee Machado leads tours of the orchards for local school children to teach them where food comes from. Bobby Machado supports the Auburn Symphony each year through a donation of apples to the symphony in the park. And whereas Shawnee Machado manages the store while Gary Machado devotes his time to the orchards, which is a year-round task, and whereas the orchards have been cared for and passed down from generation to generation since Joseph Machado's arrival in 1923, and whereas family-owned businesses like Machado Orchards are one of the things that make Placer County such a special place to live, visit, and shop, now therefore, let it be known that the Placer County Board of Supervisors would like to recognize Machado Orchards for their contribution to the rich agricultural history of Placer County, and we wish to congratulate them on their 90th anniversary. Congratulations to all of you, and thank you so much for joining us today. And if you'd like to come to the lectern, if any of you have anything you would like to say, or if you're very shy and you don't want to say anything, that's fine as well. Oh, come on. Um, I wasn't expecting to say a speech, but we really appreciate everything you, the county has done for us. And um, Rashados has come a long way since 1923. Uh, we have so many customers to thank and be grateful for. We know them by name as they come in the store. Uh, we're throwing a great big apple festival in October. It's October 19th. We have over 20 vendors already signed up. We'll have apple picking. We have a live band, the Pine Street Ramblers. Right. And it's going to be a lot of fun. We'll have our apples will be 49 cents a pound. Taste testing in the store of our apple juice, applesauce, and just about anything else you want to try. So hopefully we'll see all you there. It's already on my calendar, Shawnee, awesome. so I'm really looking forward to it. Thank you so much. Bobby or Gary, did you want to say anything? Thank you for the board, all of the Board of Supervisors and Jennifer. Thank you. We also support the Bowman, uh, Washington, D.C., trip to, um, to Washington, D.C. for the eighth grade class. Also, I... Um, um, donate the Auburn Symphony for two performances at the Bowman School also. So we do a lot for the Bowman School. And we, I apologize, we couldn't get it all on the, on no. the accommodation. <laughs> Thank you, John. Thank you. I'm going to come down and get a few pictures. Gary, did you want to add anything? No, he's the shy one in the family. And I just want to thank you for your perseverance in the agricultural community over the years. Uh, having come from an agricultural family, I know the hard work that goes into that, but the rewards uh, as well. And thank you so much for your community activity as well. Thank you. You can be in the middle because you're the guy. <laughs> Thanks everybody for coming by. <laughs> Thanks for bringing that forward, Supervisor Montgomery. Truly my pleasure. Now we'll move to our 9.30 timed item. Oh, this, no, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You got a minute and we're gonna move forward. Okay. Is there any more public comment? Okay, seeing none, we'll move to Supervisor Committee reports. Any Supervisor Committee reports? 
Then we'll move to our consent agenda, which will be approved by a roll call. Are there any items on the consent agenda that any board member wishes to pull for discussion? Is there anyone in the audience that has an item on consent that they wish to pull for discussion? Seeing none, we'll bring it back to the board for action. Move approval. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the consent agenda. Will the clerk please call the roll? Montgomery? Yes. Duran? Why can't? Yes. Euler? Holmes? Aye. All right, now, if it's okay, we'll move to our 930 timed item, the Sierra Nevada Conservancy Annual Update, presented by Executive Director, Mr. Jim Branham. Good morning. Good morning, Supervisor Holmes and uh, board members. I noticed it's noted as an annual report. We haven't quite been that good at coming back, but oh, um, well. we thought now was actually a good time to come and uh, present the board based on kind of where we are as an organization and such. And I've got some packets I'll pass out at the end. I don't okay. like opening the map and being totally distracted, so <laughs> I'll do a little later. But thank you for this, uh, this opportunity. Um, we, uh, as I think you know, are headquartered about, uh, I don't know, a couple hundred yards from here, so I had quite a commute to come over uh, this morning, but we've certainly enjoyed having uh, Placer County as our uh, home office for these last uh, eight years and um, look forward to continuing to, um, to uh, be a part of the community. I think, I guess I just would do that. I think most of you are aware of the kind of the history of the Conservancy, our mission and so on. That's, that's a map. As you can see, we cover about a quarter of the state, 25 million acres, all are part of 22 counties. We've got a, a mission that truly is to uh, integrate the environmental, economic, and social well-being of this region in carrying out our programs. Um, six, uh, six of our 13 voting members on our board are county supervisors. Each of the six sub-regions identified up there select uh, someone to serve. Um, currently, Supervisor Briggs from El Dorado County represents the central sub-region. Um, Supervisor Weigand was our second representative from the central sub-region. Placer County's uh, turn on the board is coming back um, next year. So uh, we look forward to Placer being represented again and certainly appreciate the contributions that Supervisor Weigand made as a board member and, uh, and generally as a, a strong supporter of the Conservancy and appreciate those of you on the board as well who've been, who've been supportive. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, our Proposition 84 program. Um, this was actually kind of the basis for us to visit all 22 counties again. We've um, developed a report which um, provides information about that investment in the region. It highlights certain projects as representative of uh, that investment um, consistent with that mission. We're about 90% of the way through our Prop 84 dollars, so um, it seemed like a good time to, uh, to, to be able to talk a little bit about what that investment has meant. And here in Placer County, we've um, almost $6 million worth of grants uh, in the county. If you are uh, halfway decent at math, 22 counties divided into 50 million would tell you that uh, Placer County is well above the average in terms of those, those awards. A lot of really good projects have come to us from Placer County. I, I think you actually have one of the projects later on your agenda that you're going to be taking action on that was a SNC award. And I see uh, Jeff Darlington from the Placer Land Trust here. Um, we've, really, we've had an open competitive process. We basically have kind of opened the doors and said bring us your ideas consistent with our mission, consistent with our criteria. Tried to keep it very uh, transparent. We've brought um, outside evaluators in to really try to get to the place where we are able to find the best projects. And luckily, we've had a number of those projects here in Placer County. There's 28 projects that have been awarded. Um, those are just a couple of uh, couple of examples. And um, interestingly enough, the two presentations you had previously kind of tie in nicely. I don't know that we could have been that. That lucky to have that. We had a fuels reduction project, which uh, is actually occurring. Um, improved forest and management includes fuel reduction on property owned by the land trust, as well as a uh, conservation easement at, in um, uh, in the citrus area of the county. And so, the the um, the need to manage our forests, the need to reduce the fire risk, the need to promote and preserve working landscapes are, are very important to us and have been um, represented in this county. We have a total of 11 different grantees who've received um, grant awards, um, again, kind of ranging from those that you just saw, work that we've done um, on Hidden Falls, 
um, work we've done throughout the county, really, from the uh, the eastern end to the western, um, and um, to really fund, as I say, a wide range of very worthwhile projects. And so we're really pr proud of the work we've done here under Proposition 84. And I'll return to Prop 84 in just a moment, but I do want to talk about a couple of things that we've also been involved in that have a more of a region-wide focus. Um, it became pretty clear to us early on that the issue of fire, the issue of forest health, and the issue of community well-being were uh, were inextricably linked and were really at the core of our mission. Um, when we look at, around our region, um, so many communities uh, in the region are, are really struggling economically with uh, what was once uh, many communities supported by a, uh, uh, an industry that including mills and, and logging. Um, uh, that landscape has changed significantly and, um, and communities are, are struggling with that. At the same time, we see communities we see it live and in person, unfortunately, today that are that are surrounded by forests, many of which are, are overgrown and are at risk of the kinds of fires we're seeing um, in the canyon um, this last week. And uh, the smoke was a little better this morning, at least walking over here. So hopefully the, those winds, I, I, I will say half-jokingly that we kind of hoped some easterly winds would come in and blow that, some of that smoke to Sacramento to remind them what we're dealing with up here and the, re, and the, real, the real challenges we face. But our, our Sierra Nevada Forest and Community Initiative has been one that we, we launched some time ago. We've coordinated our Proposition 84 grant program, but we've also done a lot of work in communities throughout the region who are trying to figure out where they go from here. How do they take actions that can bring forests um, back to ecological health, can, can remove some of the threat that they face as communities, create local uh, jobs and activities, and, and bringing those together. So there's a number of collaborative efforts we've been very supportive of, um, really up and down the range. Um, and we have certainly um, become much more involved in the, uh, the work going on around trying to create uh, and expand markets for the biomass that needs to be removed as part of that forest health effort. Um, certainly logs are a part of the equation, but there's a lot of material that's not merchantable. So that's become a real focus of ours, forest biomass energy, as well as maybe other uses for that biomass. Um, another project we've had the region-wide is our Sierra Nevada geotourism project um, in Placer County. There's 130 destinations on the map. We're constantly building our uh, building our viewership of the website through phone apps and so on. We think it's a great project that was built from the bottom up. Communities came together. They nominated the places that are really kind of unique to that place. Geotourism is really about what, where, where's that opportunity you can have that is really like in, uh, unlike any other that you can find even elsewhere in the Sierra Nevada. So it's been a, a great project. Um, I've got a map in here, and probably most of you have gotten that in the past, but a map. Um, and the map is really, the hard map has really become a kind of a portal to the, to the web application. When we partnered with National Geographic and Sierra Business Council, the first meeting we had was a question about a hard map. Is that really the, the end product? Because those seem like those are stuff that, you know, our kids are going to find someday and say, what the heck did they do with these? Um, but it really has become, it's a great map. It's got a lot of information on it, but it really is a portal. The, the number of places that are on that website have, have grown exponentially since we produced uh, the map. And um, as I say, it's just something we feel good about. It's helping from a tourism standpoint and a recreational opportunity and, and literally putting places on the map that we think are pretty special. Um, finally, we've coordinated the Great Sierra River cleanup. Um, we have an event um, later next in 21st of September. Um, it was really an effort to bring a lot of different um, river cleanups, watershed cleanups together, provide them some coordination, some support, some, some uh, media coverage and so on to try to build those. We've been able to bring some new uh, cleanups uh, together as well. And it really has become a, a great event um, um, on an annual basis. I know we've had uh, the then Assemblyman, now Senator Gaines, out a couple of times here in the American River Canyon as part of the cleanup. We've really tried to use it. I think we've got 11 or 12 legislative sponsors who are outside of our Sierra Nevada region. We're really trying to connect those folks who benefit from our stewardship of the watersheds with, uh, with these kinds of activities. Um, and unfortunately, um, we never seem to run out of trash to remove from the rivers. It's a sad commentary, I guess, but it's, it's one that uh, we feel is worthwhile work. Um, I wanted to also talk about a couple of things that have gone on specific, uh, specifically here in uh, Placer County. They're, they're, they're related in a way, if you will. We've been a strong supporter and have done um, what we could to move the county's efforts forward on the Cabin Creek bioenergy facility. We're pleased that progress continues to be made there. We think it's an important, um, uh, an important facility for a number of reasons, not the least of which is 
the need in Placer County, but also for us, it really gives us, um, you've kind of been the, the, the pioneer in moving these small-scale biomass, uh, forest biomass facilities forward, and we, I think, are all learning a lot from that. We, um, we apologize in some ways of the scars that the county may have coming through that process, but they're, they're, they are going to be uh, badges of honor, we think. It's really badly needed. We're working throughout this region to try to figure out how we create more of that infrastructure. Um, you know, most of us don't believe the days of big mills and all of these communities are coming back, and we have to ask ourselves what are the alternatives, and this is an opportunity to create um, a needed outlet for that biomass, but also create the jobs that go both with uh, with the facility, but also the work that, uh, that needs to go on um, in these communities. And we are working with Supervisor Montgomery and folks in Forest Hill. We're actually hosting a meeting. I guess this will be the week for community meetings in Forest Hill um, this Thursday to talk about the potential there for a facility. There's interest from some of the folks locally. We are helping convene that meeting to really get the community's uh, input and engagement and, and um, kind of buy in on where we go next. So that's an important project that we are um, we're working on currently in the county. So finally, um, as I mentioned, we're, we're coming to the end. This next year we'll probably uh, spend the remainder of the $50 million in grant money that we were provided under Proposition 84. Um, we're really proud of what has been accomplished during that time, um, but we're hungry for more. So um, we are working hard um, in Sacramento currently around various ideas floating around a water bond, which is currently on the ballot for next November. Most most, no one believes it's going to stay on the ballot in that form for next November. New legislation or new amendments being uh, introduced almost um, daily. Um, but I think we're having some, some very positive conversations around uh, the very simple notion of you can't truly pass the giggle test of talking about a fix to California's water future without investing in the upper watersheds. Our region is the source of more than 60 percent of the state's developed water. Um, we have to keep investing. When these fires occur, bad things happen in a variety of ways, not the least of which is next winter there will be a whole bunch of sediment pumped into the system. And as that sediment ends up in reservoirs, our storage capacity is reduced. And it's something that we need to be cog cognizant of beyond all the other kind of challenges we face. So it's an un uncertain future for us. We know we've got a lot of work we're going to continue to do without a, bond, without a grant program. But we also realize having a grant program, being able to invest in this region is, is really critically important. So we're making that case. We'd uh, invite all of you who, uh, who are occasionally in Sacramento, I know at least a few of you get down there on a regular basis, uh, to make that case as well in terms of the importance of continuing to invest. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions or take any comments. And questions, comments, Supervisor Montgomery. Uh, <clears throat> Jim, I want to thank you for the presentation. It's always good to sort of get the larger view of what's going on since we all tend to be focused on our own pieces of this. And I also really want to thank the Conservancy for um, really stepping up to the plate for Thursday's meeting. We are, um, fortuitously, I'm not quite sure is the correct word, but we are going to offer the Forest Service 10, 15 minutes at the beginning of that meeting to give us an update on the fire. So sure. I'll bring that back to the board as well. Um, I was at the Lake Tahoe Summit yesterday, which, you know, obviously focuses on Tahoe, but I was really heartened to hear um, in some of the discussions, both at the formal summit itself and outside, um, that there's becoming a, uh, a better understanding that we need to take a much broader view of our forests and our watersheds in California. Um, and that's always a little hard in Tahoe because everyone is so focused on the lake itself. But um, did have the opportunity to have some discussions with both our state and federal leaders about how critical it is. And again, not sure if it's fortuitous, but there was a little smoke in the air so was able to use that as a little bit of leverage in those discussions. And so I'd love the opportunity to sit down with you at some point and, and maybe go talk to some of our state legislators about some of the things that the future does hold and how we can work together to, to achieve all that. You bet. That'd be great, Supervisor. I'm, I'm, um we all love Tahoe, and but I have to say, at times we get a little jealous about <laughs> all the money that flows into I've Tahoe. Heard. So our ability to have them think outside of the basin would be very helpful, and and we'll definitely and enlist you to be a part of that uh, that message uh, delivery. Terrific. Thank you so much, Supervisor Wagan. Jim, thanks for uh, coming today, and thanks for the great work you've done. Uh, just for our viewers, as much as anything, I want to give a plug for the notion of a. Uh, we're Sierra Nevada Conservancy as a state agency, <clears throat> which may or may not be a good thing in and of itself, but. Um, in this case, uh, just under one member of the voting representation of the state agency is made up of local elected supervisors throughout the Sierra. And so I think as you look at Placer County and the grants that we've received, 
that reflects uh, state resources being focused on our priorities in partnership uh, with the state. And I think it's a perfect example of how government ought to work and your personal attention to that has been fantastic. So it's been a great privilege to, to, to see that partnership come into fruition. And so, so I just wanted to get that word out there and thank you and, and let folks know that that's how this particular instance, how I think has been extraordinarily successful. That's great. Thank you, Supervisor. I think having six supervisors on our board at any given time is really helpful. I think it really keeps us um, grounded in terms of the, of the region and the importance of the region and the conflict that some were concerned about between statewide appointees and county supervisors hasn't occurred. I think we've been able to work together quite well, but I think that's really important. And um, we, you know, we, we, we're a state agency that likes to think of ourselves as not being one. We like to think of ourselves a, of a, a, as a regional agency, which sometimes has connotations, but really a, an agency of the region that happens to be in state government. I think it's, it is a fortuitous kind of relationship, and we're, we're really proud of that. Um, I should have mentioned that we have our, our area representative here, Julie Griffith, Griffith Flatter. Um, they never, never put their names on the dang uh, um, PowerPoint, so I, half the time I kind of go through that. But I really want to thank uh, Julie. And we've got a fantastic staff. We have people that are very dedicated and very passionate about what we do. And that, that along with, I think, the makeup, the mission, the board, but in the end, really the staff, the people getting the work done is, uh, is, you know, is why we've been as successful as we've been. And we look forward to, to doing more. Well, on behalf of the board, I want to thank you for all the work that uh, we've been able to do together. Uh, it's been quite uh, fortuitous for us. And I want to thank you personally for your outreach. I know you're out and about all the time. And the reason I know that is because I'm out and about all the time too. So it's good to see you, uh, at, you know, through all, you know, the regional meetings and everything. So we really appreciate that. Thank you, Jim. Great. Thank you. And I'll leave these packets for you. Okay. All right. Thanks. Is there anyone else uh, wish to address the board uh, on this? Mr. Darlington. Hello. Uh, Jeff Darlington with Placer Land Trust. Um, I just wanted to say a few words of thanks to the Conservancy since they selected Auburn as the site for their headquarters eight years ago. They've really had a great influence on, on our region and I'm sort of just representing hundreds of grantors and, and partners to thank them for their investment here. Um, the Land Trust has received two grants to do fuel load reduction projects on the Bear River and the American River um, through the Conservancy. So that's uh, a direct relationship we have there. Also, um, we participate in their Sierra Nevada geotourism uh, program. We have a couple sites listed, in, including the new Canyon View Trail in Auburn. And I think this is our fourth or fifth year doing the Great Sierra River cleanup. Uh, this year we'll be doing it uh, at Miner's Ravine in Roseville. Um, the Conservancy also, as Jim referenced, has a, uh, a lot of informal influence outside their Prop 84 program. Uh, for example, the Land Trust recently acquired 160 acres on the North Fork American River that we protected for, for public recreation, and um, that came to us as a referral from the Conservancy. So although they weren't involved in the funding, they were involved in getting the project to us. Um, and of course, um, Jim mentioned that the, the county and the Conservancy are working together on the Side Hill Citrus Conservation Easement. So look forward to seeing that move forward um, next month, I, I believe. Um, and just to reiterate what Jim said, as the state considers new funding mechanisms like the water bond, it's really important that our local community and our local um, government representatives let Sacramento know that the Sierra Nevada and the Sierra Nevada Conservancy in Placer County really get the funding that we deserve in terms of um, our contributions to the state and in terms of protecting and enhancing the quality of life we have here. So I encourage you to continue to support the Conservancy in, in ways that uh, bring resources to the region. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Anyone else wish to address the board on the Sierra Nevada Conservancy? Seeing none, we'll move on to our, and thank you again, Jim, I appreciate you being here. Uh, we'll move on to our 945 timed item, Health and Human Services Medical Clinics. This is a Bielsen hearing regarding pharmacy services. Ms. Bauman, good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Maureen Bauman with the Adult System of Care. This morning there is a request for your consideration that will require three actions. One, to hold a public hearing to receive input on a proposed closure of the county-operated pharmacy facility. 
and the transition of that service to private pharmacies with no service reduction, effective September 1st, 2013. Second, to approve a blank purchase order, um, a change in the blank purchase order with Rite Aid Pharmacy, increasing the amount by $475,000. And third, to designate the Department of Health and Human Services Medical Clinics to provide a 24-hour information service regarding the closure of the pharmacy mm -hmm. and the alternative available of availability of pharmacy services. So a little background. The provision of medica medical care to medically indigent adults has been a, adults has been a state mandated responsibility of counties since 1982 and is provided in Placer County through the Medical Care Services Program, also known as MCSP. This program has included medical services as well as the prescriptions um, that people need, medicines that they need as part of the service that we've provided. And Placer County um, established a pharmacy at some point in the past to uh, efficiently provide the medications that people needed through this program, and it was determined at that time that that was the most efficient and cost-effective way to do that service. I just want to note the pharmacy is not able to uh, utilize the Medi-Cal program, so it's not able to get reimbursement through the Medi-Cal program in the current setup. Uh, so the business model is change is critical as the majority of persons that are accessing the clinic are going to be on Medi-Cal after January of 2014. The pharmacy is located at the Auburn Government Center. It's just in the middle of the medical clinic services system. Health and Safety Code mandates that prior to closing any uh, county medical service, the board shall hold a public hearing on its decision to proceed with the closure designate the agency, as I mentioned, to provide 24-hour information service regarding the closure and what the alternative services will be to the public, listing those services in the telephone directory under the county listing. In August of 2012, Placer County participated in the Medicaid expansion program. This program allows Placer County to dread on federal reimbursement, as you know, uh, for the medical services provided through the MCE program to recipients, and that includes pharmacy services. It's expected now that the majority of people that were formerly on the MCSB program are going to be on the MCE program, and that that population is going to become Medi-Cal eligible in January of 2014. So the dynamics in terms of our medical care services is really changing. And as a result of the transition of these people to the Medi-Cal program, we're expecting the number of people that are going to remain on the MCSB program to be dramatically reduced. Currently, the number of people on MCE is over 3,000 people, and the number of persons on MCSP right now is less than 20. Now, some of that will change over time. People won't, you know, will miss deadlines, et cetera, but we just do see a pretty dramatic change in terms of that service. In the past three months, approximately 1,158 people obtained services from the Auburn Medical Clinic Pharmacy. Those patients were either MCSP or MCE people that were um, receiving services in the Auburn Medical Service. I point out on the MCE program, people also get services at Chapa Day Indian Health and the Well Space program down in Roseville. So the Auburn Medical Clinic Pharmacy is open from 8 to 12 noon and from 1 to 5, Monday through Friday. And the shift in this new business model using private pharmacies will increase the available hours of private pharmacies by 46 hours. So that will include hours that go until 10 p.m. during the weekdays and hours that are for 10 to 6 on, on the weekends. So people will have much more availability in terms of being able to get their medicines prescribed and uh, refilled. The establishment of the MCE program in Placer County has provided an alternative pharmacy option to people who now no longer need to go to the medical clinic. Um, so with MCE, like I said, in the south area where people are getting other services like at WellSpace, they can just currently use those pharmacies. And this whole dynamic is really causing us to reevaluate the need for pharmacy services in Placer County. In January 2014, if I said persons that are currently MCE programs will go to Medi-Cal, and then those patients um, will not be a county responsibility, and they will be able to use whatever pharmacy they want in terms of um, getting their prescriptions filled. The Auburn Medical Clinic Pharmacy currently has staffing allocations for one pharmacist and one pharmacist technician. The incumbent pharmacist retired in July, which has resulted in us in a contractual arrangement for temporary pharmacist to provide services until um, since that time. And the incumbent pharmacy technician has been offered and accepted a lateral transfer to another vacant funded position within the department. The cost savings from this change are salary savings from these two positions and reduced medication costs for the approx of an approximate total of $528,000 annually. However, when you net the cost out uh, with the pharmacy technician cost 
continuing to another position and the increased cost for contracted pharmacy services, the net savings to the county is approximately $213,000. Um, we expect the change to the uh, Rite Aid, the blank purchase order, to uh, provide those necessary medication services through December 31st of 2013 when the MC program will end and the Medi-Cal program will begin for the vast majority of people. Um, after date, that date, uh, we will continue to contract out those services, but it will be a much, much smaller contract, and we'll work with the procurement services to determine the best way to proceed with establishing a new contract with that, a new scope of work. Health and Human Services is proposing to stop providing county-operated pharmacy services on September 1, 2013, resulting in enhanced services for patients eligible for both the MCE and the MCSP program who will then be able to go to any Rite Aid pharmacy in Placer County to fill their prescriptions. Rite Aid has multiple locations in Placer and has hours of operation, as I said, that include weekends and um, evenings, making it more convenient for patients to be able to fill their prescriptions. The and notice details these changes and attached for your is attached for your reference. So I'd be happy at this point to rec, you know um, answer any questions, and then I think we proceed with the public hearing, and the and then I would recommend approval, obviously. Okay. Any uh, supervisor Montgomery? Uh, yeah, Maureen. Thank you. I, my my one concern that I have about this, because I think generally this is a great step, is. Um, thinking about the 5th District, I don't believe there are any Rite Aids between Auburn and Kings Beach. There's a small Rite Aid in Kings Beach, and there's one here in Auburn. I don't think Colfax has one in – there is one in Truckee, but that's Nevada County. Is there any opportunity um, to reach some kind of deal with the Rite Aid in Truckee um, so that people in the east end of the county have access to a Rite Aid? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. In fact, currently, there is no pharmacy services in Tahoe, so right. um, that probably is already in place, but I'll verify that that is in place. Excellent. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other board member comments? Seeing none, I'll go ahead and open up the public hearing. This is the public hearing, Bielsen hearing. Is there anyone from the public that wishes to address the board on this item? Seeing none, I will close the public hearing and bring back the issue for action. It's been moved and seconded to approve uh, the items number, the Health and Human Service Medical Clinics items. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Hearing none, thank you. Thank you. Now we'll move to our 10 o'clock timed item, which is Pacific Gas and Electric Pipeline Safety Enhancement Program. Mr. McKenzie. Congratulations on your new uh, position. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, I'm Greg McKenzie, here today uh, to reintroduce myself uh, to you in a new role with PGE. and uh, Most of you know me from my time with Del Webb and Pulte Homes over the years, uh, City of Rockland Planning Commission, the various chambers around the county, uh, District 3 representative to your Fish and Game Commission, uh, City of Rockland Planning Commission, uh, you know, whole host of, uh, oh, Placer Land Trust Board. Uh, and so uh, not unfamiliar with the county, obviously, a fourth generation Placer County resident. And uh, for those of you who know my family history, both my father and my grandfather retired from the company after 30 some odd years. And so uh, 20 years into my career, here I am representing pg e as your uh, government affairs representative. So. Going forward in times of emergency or uh, issues that you may have, I will now forward serve as your uh, primary contact. Uh, and I do have some cards with updated information. All right. And uh, with that, I will introduce Ashley Simpson and her team to d discuss our pipeline safety and enhancement project. Thank you. Good morning, Ashley. Good morning. Do we have the PowerPoint that... Uh, I think there's a power. Do I click the note? They should have it. Uh... <clears throat> Greg, do you have the PowerPoint back there for PG&E? That's uh... the presentation's better with the PowerPoint. So. <laughs> yeah. You don't have one. Oh, you didn't receive it. Well, huh. okay. 
Well, I'll go through the presentation. <laughs> All right, great. We'll skip the pictures and the map parts. Um, Mr. Chair, members of the board, I wanted to thank you this morning for allowing us the opportunity to talk to you about an upcoming project that we have within Placer County. My name is Ashley Simpson. I'm a, man a manager with uh, government relations, uh, specifically focusing on um, gas operations infrastructure upgrades. In 2011, pg and &E initiated an accelerated infrastructure upgrade program to increase the safety of our natural gas pipeline system. The Pipeline Safety Enhancement Program, or PSEP as it's called, um, consists of four major components. Inspecting and modernizing our pipelines, which consists of hydrostatically testing our pipelines where we pressurize our pipelines with water to test the, the um, operating strength of our pipelines. Pipeline replacement where we'll go in um, and re place existing pipelines that we have deemed too old or, or are in a, a difficult location, we'll replace them with a new um, pipeline. Internal pipeline inspections, since our pi most of our transmission pipelines were put in the ground, technology has advanced uh, significantly, um, which has allowed us to, to be able to inspect our pipelines from the inside, providing MRI, essentially, um, capabilities of looking at our pipelines. Um, and then also retrofitting old pipelines to be able to, to ah, there, it there it is. There we are. All right. Um, and then retrofitting our, our existing pipelines to make sure that they're capable of taking that inline inspection technology. Um, what we're also doing is upgrading our, our valves that help close off our, our pipeline system. We're making them automated so that they can be controlled from our gas control operation center in the East Bay. Um, we're also improving our records keepings. We're digitalizing a lot of our, our records that go back throughout the past century. Um, and we're taking immediate steps of increasing our leak surveys uh, uh, and the frequency of our leak surveys and reducing pressure on some parts of our, our transmission pipeline system. Hmm. Let's see. Well, if you could see the next slide. <laughs> there it is. There, oops. Is that it? There it is, yes. All right. All right. In the coming months, pg and &E will begin a pipeline replacement project on our transmission pipeline, Line 123, which runs through Placer County and through Roseville. The process of replacing placing a pipeline requires us to install a new pipeline in the ground, inspect and test the pipeline prior to putting it into service. We'll then connect the pipe, new pipeline to our new system, or the new pipeline into our system, and retire our old pipeline. All the while, we'll be communicating heavily with the affected public around it. Through Placer County, we'll be, taking the, we'll be using the first type of replacement, um, which is replacing the existing pipe in place. So we will be paralleling our, our current line. Um, so it, to, let's see, I'm sorry. So we'll be replacing our new pipeline in line with our current pipeline alignment. Um, there is a section in R Roseville that we will be rerouting the pipeline to take a new approach that gets it um, into a street that we think is more conducive to, to our pipeline and our infrastructure. Once our pipeline is safely in the ground, we will inspect, thoroughly inspect and test the pipeline. So we, what we do is we will use x-ray technology to check the, the, um, the welds on our pipeline as we, we put it in the ground. And we'll also um, conduct a pressure test on our pipeline, once it, the new pipeline, once it's in the ground to, again, ensure the, the operating pressure. Once the new pipeline is in the ground, we'll have to um, vent the existing, we'll isolate the section of pipeline that we'll be installing. Um, we'll have to vent that pipeline of its natural gas, so there will be a release of natural gas once we um, connect the new pipeline. Prior to, to doing this, what we call a venting, we'll notify the, the surrounding public to let them know that they may smell gas. We'll also be notifying first responders and also elected officials just in case there are concerns from the neighborhood that everyone in the, the communities know what's going on. Um, let's see. What our communities can expect during the, the construction is typical of most construction. Um, PG&E PG trucks and heavy equipments will have uh, boom trucks, will have excavators. Uh, there will be traffic restrictions and, um, and redirections as needed. Most of the area in Placer County is not on um, enfranchise and public roadways, so we'll see less of that, but there will still be some. And those restrictions will be communicated with the public. Um, 
The reason why we keep the existing pipeline um, operating until we install the new one is so that we don't have to take service outages. Um, so we do everything that we can to make sure that the customers that are fed off of that line are receiving uninterrupted services during our construction. And as I mentioned, the, the smell of gas, gas and the, the noise that's associated with purging our pipelines um, may, be, may be expected from the communities, but again, we'll be communicating that as, as we move forward. The scope of this project, it's a large replacement project, so we're going to be breaking it up into two years. The, what I'm here to talk to you about this morning is the 2013 section. Um, it has a beginning point of Baseline Road between Alc, or Oak Avenue and Milnes Avenue at our PG&E valve lot, um, and it continues south through private property and ends about 1,000 feet uh, south of uh, PFE Road. In 2000, or there's also another section of about 800 feet that's at the um, Thunder Valley uh, Casino property it, that's all done in private property that we expect to do this year. Um, and in 2014, uh, about 1,700 feet north of Blue Oak Road in um, north of Placerville, um, and we'll continue north for about five miles, I think, up through Lincoln. We hope to start the 2013 uh, portion very soon. Here's kind of a map of the 2013 section. And that line runs, continues running south, I think, down through Citrus Heights. As I mentioned, we do a lot to communicate with our publics that may be affected through this. Um, some of the different types of outreach that we have, we will do send out letters to residents that live within anywhere between 500 and 2,000 feet of the pipeline route, letting them know that they can s expect to see the construction, what we're doing so that no one is surprised by the work that we're doing. In that, we will also, in that letter, we'll be also be inviting them to an open house that we'll be having where the, the communities can come and, and talk to our subject matter experts, talk to our construction crews, see maps of the, the um, route that we plan to, to work on. They'll also have an opportunity to, to look at pictures to kind of get an idea of, of what the project looks like. Um, like I mentioned, we'll have subject matter experts there to be able to answer any of the questions that may come up. Um, in the letter, we'll also include fact sheets that give an overview of what the project will look like. Um, I mentioned the, the open house. We'll also provide door hangers to the, the areas that may be affected um, prior to construction starting. So a few days before construction starts, we'll go out and door hang the immediate area where they'll see the construction. Um, through this letter, we also have a, a customer impact specialist who will be assigned to, to the residents in this area. It's a live person they'll have the phone number of that they can get a hold of at any time should they have any concerns. And of course, the, we all also send out automated phone calls um, prior to the venting to let people know in the area. If anybody would like to get more information on this project or more information on the upgrades that we're doing to our, our natural gas system, um, there is a, a 1-800 number that's set up, um, that's up on the screen, uh, that specifies, or that's specific to our gas um, issues, and then also on our website, pg&e.com slash gas. Finally, with that, I have the project team here. Should you guys have any questions? All right, any questions? <clears throat> Supervisor Duran. Yes, uh, th thank you very much for, for uh, writing this update. Of course. You know, I seem to recall back in 2010, I was just coming on the board that uh, there was a correspondence from CEDRA um, uh, concerning the size of the pipe. And I think the concern was the actual diameter of the pipe as well as whether or not the pipe was going to be steel. I, I notice in your memo here um, that it says that your, the pipe was originally placed in 1943 with a 12-inch steel pipe and that you're going to use 16-inch diameter pipe, but it doesn't say whether or not that is a steel pipe or composite or, or, or what have you. Oversight on my part, I apologize for that. All of our transmission lines are made out of steel. Okay. Yes. And what size is, is 16 the next step up, or is there a couple more steps after that? Is there an 18-inch pipe? What's your, what's your biggest pipe that you use? Well, so our, our transmission system is kind of our backbone system that, that carries our large quantities of gas throughout the service territory. So it's, it's, they're usually larger sizes. Um, we have up to 36-inch pipes and sometimes larger, depending on what part of our backbone the, the system it's in. Okay. Um, 12 is, is on the smaller size for capacity purposes. We're taking this opportunity to upgrade the, the pipeline um, to better feed the Roseville area. Okay. Um, so 16 inches would 
essentially be one of the next steps up. Okay. Was there some type of a study done with regards to why uh, 16 was selected? Is that a standard for that type of usage or, or, or what? Well, so again, it, it's a, we know that with the growth in Roseville um, that we've seen, the, the pipeline 12 inches, uh, a 12 inch diameter of pipeline wasn't going to be sufficient to, to feed the area as much as it's needing, especially with the growth that they have out there. The engineers have, do they use algorithms to determine what the, the best size to, to feed the projected growth in that area would be, and, and 16 inches is what okay. they've decided. This is Linda Tripp. She's the project manager. Hi there. Good morning, Linda. Good morning. Um, this pipeline was installed in 1943 with a 12-inch line. And over the years, in order to meet the existing demands, um, there's probably been about four miles of it within Placer County that has already been replaced with a 16-inch. So by replacing the entire line with a 16-inch, that way we're able to maintain and inspect it with our pigs. Putting the spark pigs in the pipelines is important to have a consistent diameter throughout. Okay. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't seen any follow-up uh, memo since that memo in 2010, so I think probably uh, it's best to consult with Cedra to see if there's any um, issues on that. But thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Any other comments from board members? Don't see any. Anybody in the audience wish to address the board on this particular item? Seeing none, thank you for letting us know, and thank you for all the public outreach that you're doing to Great. I'm sure you'll get some calls, and so will Supervisor Duran and Supervisor Wagon about what the heck's going on. But you've done we your part. Look forward to them. All right. Great. Thank, Thank you, you very much. You bet. So that concludes our timed items. We will now move to our uh, department items. Uh, item five: administra Administrative Services Procurement. Mr. Wood, Mr. Manning, Mr. Bigney. And gentlemen, before you start, I'd like to recognize your uh, department for receiving the National Procurement Institute Achievement of Excellence in Procurement Award. Dear Chairman Holmes, I'm pleased to inform you that your agency's procurement department has earned the 18th Annual Achievement of Excellence in Procurement Award for 2013. The Achievement of Excellence Procurement Award recognizes organizational excellence in procurement. Public and nonprofit organizations earn the award by attaining a high application score based on standardized criteria, and I believe you scored 100% on the uh, application on the score. The judging criteria are designed to measure innovation, professionalism, e-procurement, productivity, and leadership attributes of the procurement function. Placer County is one of only 36 government agencies in California and one of only 43 counties, there's over 3,000 counties in the United States, to receive the award. One of only 43 throughout the United States. This is the 11th consecutive Achievement of Excellence in Procurement Award for Placer County. So I just thought that would be important to let the public know and thank you for your continued excellence. Thank you, Chairman Holmes. We appreciate that. We have um, we recognize that it wouldn't be possible without the support of the board and management to the county as well as the customers and vendors that we work with. Thank you. With respect to the item today, we're, my name is Brett Wood, and I'm a purchasing manager. And I'm here with Mr. Bob Bigney, also with the procurement division. And we're with item 5A at this time, which is a request to approve a renewal of negotiated blanket purchase orders in the aggregate amount of $2,025,000 for construction management services, including construction management, construction inspection, and construction material testing with various vendors throughout the county. Mr. Bigney will provide some additional background and then we'll be happy to stand for any questions. In February of 2012, your board approved the award of new blanket purchase orders and the renewal of existing blanket purchase order agreements with eight firms associated with a qualified list for on-call construction management services for the Department of Public Works. These blanket purchase orders have been utilized to supplement Public Works staff over the past four years and have proved to be a productive and viable option to cover peak workload demands 
and provide expertise when needed. A blanket purchase order is expired July 31st, 2013. The Department of Public Works continues to require construction management services to supplement current department staff for the construction of various public works projects. Procurement Services recommends that your board approve the renewal of these nine blanket purchase orders, each in the amount of $225,000 for a total maximum aggregate amount of $2,025,000 for the period of August 1st, 2013 through April 30, 2014 and authorize the purchasing manager to sign the resulting blanket purchase orders and transfer funds between blanket purchase order agreements as needed. I'll be happy to answer any questions your board may have. All right, any questions from board members? Seeing none, is there anyone in the audience that has a question or concern? Seeing none, we'll bring it back for action. It's moved and seconded to approve the blanket purchase orders for the Department of Public Works. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. Then we'll move to item 5B, blanket purchase orders probation. Mr. Manning. Good morning again. Item 5B is a request to approve two blanket purchase orders awarded from State of Washington co competitive contracts with satellite tracking people LLC of Houston, Texas and Alcohol Monitoring Systems Inc. of Littleton, Colorado for electronic monitoring equipment and services in the maximum aggregate amount of $445,000. This is funded by the Probation Department's proposed budget for fiscal year 2013-14 and, uh, and for the period of August 20th through September 30th, 2014. With me is Mr. John Manning, who will provide some additional background on this item, and then we're happy to stand for any questions you may have. Good morning. The Placer County Probation Department requires annual blanket purchase orders for the purchase of electronic monitoring equipment and services for the department's offender monitoring programs. These programs are designed to monitor offenders in lieu of jail time and help to reduce the county's inmate population. These products and services are available to purchase by the county under the Western States Contracting Alliance National Association of State Procurement Officials Cooperative Purchasing Group LLC contract number 00212 which was competitively bid and awarded by the state of Washington on June 4th, 2013 and is currently in effect through December 31st of 2016. Procurement Services requests your board's approval of the recommended BPOs and I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have on this item. Any questions from board members? Seeing none, is there anyone in the audience who wishes to address the board on this item? Seeing none, we'll bring it back to board correction. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I, Supervisor Grant. I just had a comment. Um, I, I had the opportunity to attend the uh, uh, AMS systems uh, uh, presentation. It was a CLE, or, um, CLE opportunity, and there was quite a few folks from the uh, uh, county's uh, defense bar as well as the um, uh, DA's office. And I was really impressed with the uh, with the technology and and um, uh, the ability for them to monitor uh, alcohol and and the burn off of alcohol um, several hours after someone's been picked up. So that's that's was pretty interesting. Um, so I think this is going to be real beneficial for um, our uh, law enforcement and public safety departments. Any other questions, comments? Is there a motion? It's been moved and seconded to approve uh, item 5B, numbers 1, 2, and 3 for the blanket purchase orders for probation. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any, no, any abstentions? Any no's? Seeing none, we'll move forward to item number 6, the Board of Supervisors, minutes of uh, July 23rd. Approval. Moved and seconded to approve minutes of the July 23rd. 2013 meeting. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? One abstention. Supervisor Grant abstains. And now we'll move to item 6 1 the, uh, from our uh, supplemental agenda the budget, final budget workshop follow up. Mr. Andy Heath. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. I'd like to give you a brief presentation to follow up with the uh, board to provide clarification and get further direction for additional information resulting from Thursday's final budget workshop that was held last Thursday. Uh, we're also looking for additional uh, board direction as we uh, proceed to the September 10th final budget workshop that will be coming up uh, in a couple of weeks. With this information, I'd just like to briefly go over some information on uh, application of one-time funding as it relates to the general fund, uh, infrastructure projects and priorities funding, and future activities. And this is just a follow-up. Those are follow-up items uh, to give you some clarification on things that were discussed at the, at the workshop. And then also go over some salary and benefits cost chart that were provided at the request of a board member. Looking at the general fund application of one-time funding, during the workshop, we actually presented a slide, this slide, that discussed uh, two different alternatives. The two different alternatives were uh, presented as options at the board's discretion to allocate the approximately $5.8 million in one-time funding available in the general fund at the end of fiscal year 12-13 and beginning of 13-14. The $5.8 million can be distributed a number of ways, and the way that this chart was presented was to identify items that are identified in the funding options based on the financial uh, budget and financial policy at the board's discretion. Specifically looking at achieving the 5% minimum target uh, for the operating and contingency reserves, uh, looking at one-time funding uh, not being used to finance ongoing operational costs, that is one-time funding only being used for one-time costs, and then keeping the 1.5% operating contingency funding intact uh, as we go from year to year in the budget process. These two options were, again, merely presented just as hypothetical alternatives uh, toward, to the board uh, for placement of these funds. In alternative A, for example, uh, and alternative B alike, there was achievement of the 1.5% policy level for the contingency appropriation. The 116,000 brings you to the 1.5 percent of the operating budget that's necessary to put aside for the contingency, given the budget adjustments that are in the proposed final uh, the final budget. Uh, and then the 830,000 dollars is just a uh, add to the client aid reserve, the mandated cost reserve for future one-time costs that may occur as a result of unfunded mandates. The other two options, which would be the general fund reserves and the deferred on one-time infrastructure were merely presented as options, as option alternatives. Uh, the $3.4 million in Alternative A actually does get you to a point where you have the 5% in the operating general and contingency, um, economic contingency reserves or achieve that 5% target, which hasn't been achieved since 2008. And then the $1.4 million is simply the residual of the $5.8 million less the other three. In alternative B, however, all I did there was essentially split the difference between uh, the uh, of the $4.8 million that remained after you took into account the mandated cost reserve and the 1.5 percent contingency. So again, these were merely presented as options uh, at the board's discretion. Given that, however, uh, for purposes of allocating the $5.8 million moving forward uh, for the one-time funding available in the general fund, into fiscal year 2013-14. Uh, CEO's office would recommend that all available one-time funding be placed into the general and contingency reserves as a means to fund the county's general and economic contingency at the 5% level, which again has not been achieved since 2008-9, potentially address any multi-year budget model deficits that exist in the future, um, and those those multi-year deficits are currently mitigated by redirection of funding from the general fund and absorption of costs in both the public safety fund and the general fund. And then provide a backstop to economic fluctuations as they occur with expenditures and cost pressures, uh, fluctuations in revenues moving forward. This is also some information uh, on the projects and priorities funding for related to the infrastructure and the Infrastructure Investment Committee. As discussed in the board workshop, uh, staff will be returning in the fall with a separate workshop to discuss uh, the infrastructure investment priorities and funding alternatives that are currently in play. Um, this workshop will consider a full review of all Infrastructure Investment Committee activity to date, which will review the criteria, 
ranking, timing, potential funding sources, and methodologies can, can consider to develop a working list of projects. The discussion regarding direction of existing and or additional infrastructure funding that may be provided for known projects and other infrastructure alternatives will also be considered as the board continues to identify other projects that may be necessary to add to the list. That will be coming back to the board in the fall. Follow-up item to a question that was asked related to uh, the recommended budget appropriations by category, specifically looking at salaries and benefits as a percentage of the total appropriations recommended in the fiscal year 13-14 budget. Uh, salaries and percentages, uh, rep salaries and benefits represent 42.4% uh, of the appropriations in the fiscal year 13-14 budget. And of that amount, 23.7% um, is related specifically to salaries and wages, and 18.7% is related to benefits. Those are the follow-up items and clarification items that are being provided as part of the follow-up to the budget workshop last Thursday. And at this point in time, I'd be happy to take any more questions or uh, receive any direction from the board as we proceed to the September 10th uh, final budget hearing. Thank you, Andy. Supervisor Duran? Yeah, Andy, I just want to clarify. So um, on last Thursday, we had option A and B. So is it my understanding that you've now shifted your position to option A? Yeah, last last Thursday, the options that were just present, were presented were hypothetical options. Okay. Uh, what we're presenting today would be to put all of the 5.7, 5.8 million dollars into uh, reserves in the general fund. Okay. And why? And and what's your justification for that? Justification for that is there's there are a lot of uh, costs that are currently being in, in a five-year model. Um, there's deficits that need to be considered in the future. And although there is a plan to offset those deficits with uh, the uh, redirection of funding from, from reserves in the public safety fund and the general fund alike, uh, and furthermore, that there are uh, cost absorptions that are being built into both the general fund departments and the public safety departments, the deficits, because of the way the f economy is fluctuating over the next few years, still exist in the out years. Now, although those can, those can be caught up with further absorption and or further redirection, we feel that it's prudent at this time to put all of the money that's available as one-time money into reserves uh, in the general fund to offset that potentially in the future. Very good. Um, another question is, is, is after we have this discussion on infrastructure, is there going to be the opportunity perhaps to reallocate that million dollars down the road um, that we're putting into um, uh, reserves? That option does exist, yes. Okay. So it still exists. All right. Thank you, Andy. Any other more questions from board members? Uh, seeing none, I don't see any more questions from board members. Is there anyone in the audience that wishes to address the board on this uh, particular issue? Seeing none, we'll bring it back to the board for direction. Is there a uh, I, I, I think Chairman Holmes, the last place, the place that we left it is you had recommended that we go with option A. Well, I, I, I agree with the uh, uh, assessment of our CEO staff. Uh, looking at the out years, we're definitely going to have to draw down some of those reserves. So I think it's prudent to go ahead and put them in our general fund reserve. Um, just looking at the, particularly the South Placer Justice Center, there's no doubt that we'll, we'll have to draw down those reserves. So I'd just soon put them in the, the complete amount in the, our general fund reserves for, that, uh, out, for the out years. Uh, Supervisor Wagner, you had a... Yeah, I'm, I'm good with that. Also, I just wanted to make one comment. I think the thing that I'm left with after a couple of days since the budget hearings is uh, Department of Public Works graph about the condition of our roads and the grading. So, so I'm uh, generally an opponent to deferred maintenance as a way to simply comfortably balance our budgets. I think whatever assets we have, we should take care of and force everything else to stay in line with that. Um, but I sort of get the transition we're in. I'm very sensitive to the risk uh, related to prospective changes in the cost regarding realignment and other things that the state may continue to do to us. So, so I think option A is the best option at this point in time, but I guess I'd like everybody to sharpen their pencils a little bit, particularly as it relates to that one um, uh, possible 
deferred maintenance on the, on the condition of our roads because in the long run we might be just pushing that no pun intended but down the road to other members of the board of supervisors to pick up uh, pick up that particular issue and, and and that's pretty much robert the reason why i i wanted to have this discussion with with uh, ceo staff as to what are those options out there that need to be done that need to be addressed right now so and i just wanted to point out that a true general reserve does require an an emergency finding by the board here yeah for Fitzville. Uh, Supervisor uh, Euler. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want a couple observations. First of all, thank uh, CEO's office for uh, embracing this this five-year budget model that the board um, that the board has been directing for a number of years. It is um, prudent on our part to look beyond uh, are we just balanced in any given year and to do our best to anticipate what both economic and political forces will do to us uh, down the road. Of course, we know that right now um, the economic forces, unfortunately, are far more predictable than the political forces and what counties will have to continue to absorb uh, as we move forward with um, additional service delivery challenges as the state and federal government will eventually realize that um, you run out of other people's money. And one of the other things that we as a board have met and discussed on several occasions is where, where do we need to focus? Where can we spend a little bit of time, <clears throat> excuse me, a little bit of time to address these ongoing structural deficit issues that we have concerns about and are reflected in this model as we get three, four years out and we start to see those deficits return. And there are a few levers which we control, the most immediate of which is, quite frankly, and, and the, the, uh, the most cost-effective, <coughs> and it is our, um, our entitlement and our development process. We all enjoyed, uh, through the first uh, uh, half of the first decade of this century, we enjoyed the explosion in the, our assessed valuations by virtue of the entitlement process and the splitting of land and the creating of new taxable parcels and then the improvements upon those. And we also know that uh, we in Placer County have done a very good job over the years of making sure that that development does in fact pay its way and in fact we've seen that through the combination of what we have put in place by way of required improvements as projects come in fees that are paid uh, as well as what we've enjoyed by way of a, a uh, an average price point in the marketplace for homes in Placer County we actually have enjoyed um, new development actually helping to subsidize some of our existing deficiencies. And so I would simply encourage us as a county to look at, through the work that uh, Supervisor Wygant started a number of years ago on the PCCP, to look at uh, an honest evaluation and conversation regarding where we know development will happen where we already have projects approved, we have a university project and a Placer Vineyards project already approved, what can we do as the county um, using the levers that we have to encourage the kinds of investments in the ground that will move those projects forward using private dollars to move those projects forward, thereby sparking those creation of lots that we've already approved uh, the infusion of, of new property tax by virtue of the reassessment at creation of lot and the improvements and then the sales tax attendant with those homes finally becoming occupied. We can be our own economic driver in a very cost-effective fashion uh, simply by looking at the areas that we know are going to grow and in fact two projects that are already approved and trying to figure out what we can do to actually encourage those things to happen, get those improvements in the ground, get that assessed evaluation moving forward, and then the uh, the economic activity that's that's attendant with that. So, 
I think we've got some opportunities here in the next couple of years as we're looking at uh, a market that's heating back up, a lack of available inventory, um, and this big question mark about how do we fill this gap long term. Um, we have an opportunity to look at these these projects as economic catalysts to, to address that issue. And so I appreciate CEO's office's diligence in pointing out the problem to us. Um, the, uh, the, the retaining of, of Mr. Durfee to help us navigate through some of these things, and I look forward to, to that action uh, or that activity continuing and bringing us to a point where we can actually see these things moving. All right. Thank you. All righty. Any other comments from board members? Do I hear a motion? To Chairman, I would move uh, approval of, I believe, will you, you'll be coming back to us for final final in September. So all we're looking right now is you're looking for direction on alternative A. Uh, so I move approval of alternative A to be per the board's preferred alternative in preparation of final budget adoption in September. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded to approve uh, alternative A. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, any abstentions? Okay, thank you, Mr. Heath. Now we'll move to item uh, seven, South Placer Adult Correctional Facility Steam Boiler Replacement Project. Mr. Unholz. Good morning, Chairman Holmes, members of the board. I'm Rob Unholz, Capital Improvements Program Manager for Facility Services. We have two items before your board this morning regarding the South Placer Adult Correctional Facility. The first item is a recommendation <coughs> to approve the plans and specifications and authorize staff to solicit bids for the replacement of two 60 horsepower steam boilers at the uh, correctional facility <coughs> and approve a resolution authorizing the Director of Facility Services or designee to award and execute a contract in an amount not to exceed $550,000 funded by the capital project with no additional net county cost upon review and approval of County Council risk management and delegating authority to approve any necessary change orders consistent with the County Purchasing Manual and Public Contract. The South Placer Correctional Facility was designed to utilize two 60 horsepower steam boilers to support food services operations. The boilers were expected to save energy and provide reduced maintenance costs. It was initially expected, initially expected that food service personnel would be trained to operate the equipment and would meet the state requirements of a, quote, responsible individual operating the equipment. With further investigation, it became clear that this boiler assembly would require 24-hour monitoring and a specialized job specification. Um, and so we, we began to look for alternatives. California regulations do not permit automatic controls on boilers exceeding 399,000 BTUs or just over 9.5 horsepower. And they're required to be and, and actually I want to make a correction in the memo, uh, required to be monitored every 60 minutes, not 20 minutes, um, while in operation. In response, the industry has developed what they refer to as the California Special, which is approximately a nine and a half horsepower steam boiler. These can be installed in multiples, manifolded together to create the uh, supply of steam uh, that your facility requires. In order to effectively operate the food services equipment, facility services is recommending the replacement of the two 60 horsepower um, steam boilers with 10 California specials. This is expected to avoid the addition of approximately five FTEs, full-time equivalent staff, to monitor the boilers, an estimated cost of four and a half to uh, uh, 450 to $500,000 annually. Plans and specifications are sufficiently completed to solicit bids 
from qualified mechanical contractors to provide the final design equipment and installation and startup. Uh, existing work performed by the original contractor, design build contractor McCarthy Construction, um, will be will be maintained. The warranty will be maintained from from our point of connection into the building uh, on the original uh, installation. In order to proceed. The steam boiler re with the steam boiler replacement is requested that your board authorize staff to solicit bids and authorize the director of facility services to award and execute the resulting contracts. The estimated total project cost is $550,000. A deductive bid alternate is included in the bid to, uh, for the value of the existing boilers that may further reduce those costs. There are sufficient funds appropriated in the project. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Supervisor Guler? Um, Rob, this, is, this one's a head scratcher. <laughs> this one, uh, um, I, oops. I, <laughs> I, am, I, I, yeah. I, I did, did something, did something change by way of these requirements when we first bid the, these specific boilers that we ended up installing? Did, did those regulations that you identified that would require these FTEs, were those evolving? Were those they, not in they, place at the they, time? They were in place. I, okay. think, I think this is a very good example of um, as much as we love design build, and I think it helps us resolve most of the issues. Um, the mechanical engineer and mechanical contractor proceeded with the design and the, and, and the kitchen designer to to satisfy food services requirements and supply the steam to the steam kettles. And um, the train got too far out of the station before we realized that on the maintenance side, w this wasn't something we could do. Um, design build isn't perfect, and this is one of those things that we didn't specify specifically, we specified the need for for steam to to power the, the steam equipment in the kitchen, but not specifically uh, how to do that. Um, one of those things that when you find find the issue, we we look to to the best way to resolve it, and this would be our recommendation to your board. So when when the uh when a product like this is being evaluated uh, for inclusion in the overall project, um, the the operations requirements are not spec at that time. Uh, I'm just I'm the, just trying to figure the, out how to the state Calosham, as as we got further into it, um, trying to clarify that that in fact food services staff could existing staff could operate these boilers. Um, and even with the assistance of some of the sheriff jail operations staff um, trading off it, we got deeper into the regs and um, we discovered things that, that weren't provided, um, at least we didn't know about in terms of the original design. Okay. Um, it, but, but if this is something that, if this is a, a product that we didn't spec, it was proposed to meet our needs. Is there not, uh, is there not somebody's E and O insurance that covers something like this? I mean, uh, when we have project management for a reason. I mean, here our next item is right. is a extension of our construction management contract with Vanner, and I'm just wondering. We we hire construction managers and experts for a reason, and and. I would assume part of it has to do with actually building something we can operate. I I would agree, um, and uh, between staff and contract staff, construction management staff, we there were there was a lot of diligent effort into uh, kind of getting into the real real guts of these regulations, and um, we at at by that point we had accepted. Um, the maintenance and operation by our staff. Um, 
And then you you mentioned. I, I wish I weren't here with it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I I, so, I um, can I, imagine. I, I you you uh, you mentioned that there was uh, there was there's some verbiage that says something to the effect of we hope that this equipment might still have some value or a deductive bid alternative is included for the value of the existing. What is what what are we estimating that this equipment might have? It, it could be valued at somewhere between eighty and a hundred thousand dollars for the tube weapons. So for equipment or just the equipment. And the original cost of that equipment to us was um, was about one hundred and sixty thousand dollars. Oh, okay. Yeah. So not the. So we're hope we're hoping in the in the secondary market to get about fifty percent. Kind of However, like a, kind of like a car. As soon as you drive it off the lot. Uh, yes, uh, they've they've got very few hours on them. They've been tested. Um, so they're, they're very, they would be good uh, boilers for, for instance, a hospital operation where you have a 24-7 kind of operation. Uh, we are structuring the bid alternate into the final bid evaluation to uh, encourage the greatest uh, value uh, on that deductive alternate in terms of, of bid evaluation and award. And then... What have we learned for future application when we, when, I mean, I, I, can, I guess I can kind of understand how the, you wouldn't necessarily anticipate that um, we would have such specific regulations on a type of boiler that would require that level of operational expertise on a 24-7 basis, but it does exist evidently. And so what, what can we do to make sure that as we continue to proceed down the, um, uh, the path of uh, design build, we don't find ourselves in this position again? I, I think this is a very good uh, lessons learned in terms of looking at the systems uh, that we intend to specify um, for a, a project and really looking at the operational maintenance requirement. Um, and if there are any of these pitfalls, if we need to, to do a more prescriptive specification for certain items to avoid these kind of, of, of problems, um, we would certainly do so. Well, I, I have to imagine, I mean, we, we, we had language in there that said, we need boilers. They need to be able to do this. And so somebody came to us and said, we've got these boilers, they do this. Well, and so we met the requirements, but it's that additional layer that goes right. into and the O and M of these things. Sure. And and in fact, you know, we've we've had experience operation and operating our correctional kitchen for some years out at the existing main jail, um, where this isn't an issue. Right. Um, and frankly, I don't think it's it's one that anybody had on their radar. Um, unfortunately, um, it's certainly a big lessons learned. And just, I mean, a, a wild aside, there is no, or is there a particular uh, avenue, whether it's through Cal OSHA or any other uh, regulatory body through which we could obtain a waiver from these particular operational requirements? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. This doesn't hurt to ask. Yeah, you know, one, one of the... the Besides the um, hourly monitoring, that person has to be there to respond to a water lo level drop in case of emergency and be able to, to be trained on that system. And, and because these are high temp steam boilers right. to avoid what could be a real disaster. Um, it's interesting that you're going to get the same output from 10, nine and a half horse, but it works. and. Uh, and it can be controlled automatically, so they shut down if they reach those those points. The large boilers don't allow them automatic controls. Okay. All right, thank you. Supervisor Durant. Yeah, I don't want to go down the rabbit hole any deeper than we've already gone, but a couple of questions, and, and your last comment kind of uh, is, is what I'd like to focus on is, you had mentioned that the larger boilers don't allow for automatic controls. Do you know that for 
a fact or I do know that for a fact now. Okay. <laughs> and and how did you acquire that information? As we got into the Cal OSHA requirements. Okay. Um, um, have it's you a 399 any anything larger than 399,000 BTUs. Okay. Uh, and have you had have you had legal take a look at the regs on that? Uh, no, but we could have them review that. Yeah, and I would also recommend that our county council take a look at all of those bid documents and, and uh, contracts that we have. And we can talk about that later, um, Jerry. And, and Rob, you said you were working with Veneer on these going into the regs, right? Well, they are our, our contract construction manager. Um, staff worked with Vanner on evaluating these systems, yes. And, and are these boilers already in? Oh, yeah. They're already, okay, they've oh, already yes. been, they've already been. You know, in order to get, if, if we go out to bid now, we can get the boiler, boilers replaced and food services can be up and running in October as they're currently planned to. Yeah, I, I, I got a feeling this isn't the end of the story, but thank you for the information. Supervisor Montgomery. Yeah, Rob, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm sort of glad I'm not sitting where you're sitting either at the moment. Um, <laughs> One question that I just have since I am chair of the Air Pollution Control District Board this year is have we had conversations with the Air District to make sure that even though they're called California Specials, which would lead me to believe they're permittable in California, have we had discussions with them as relating to this equipment, the new equipment replacing what's already been installed and permitted? They all have to be permitted and have, um, the new ones will also have to have permit through air pollution control. Uh, no, understood that it would be a standard permitting mm -hmm. process. Have we confirmed that they are actually permittable in California? Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. All righty. Thank you, Rob. Uh, the board will consider a motion. Move approval. Okay. It's been moved and seconded to approve South Placer Adult <coughs> Correctional Facility Steam Boiler Replacement Project Number 4764A. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Any opposed, any abstentions? The motion is carried. Thank you, Rob. And Thank now you. we'll move to item 7B, South Placer Adult Correctional Facility Project Number 4764. Uh, this item is a recommendation to approve and authorize the chair to execute the second amendment to the agreement with Banner Construction Management Incorporated in the amount not to exceed $334,513 in previously budgeted net county cost with the work to be completed by June 30, 2014. Vanner um, has worked with us on the South Placer project through, um, actually through um, design and, and pre-design services into construction and um, and into enhanced commissioning. Um, in order to um, continue and ensure that the South Placer uh, facility is prepared for occupancy uh, by the spring, actually May of 2014, it uh, is recommended that we amend Vanner's contract to assist in the completion of Close out construction management tasks <coughs> and documents. Um, documentation that, uh, and that a lot of that's due to the extended construction schedule. Um, they will also be completing the remaining enhanced commissioning, uh, in system commissioning, and lead certification uh, tasks. Vanner will provide assistance with the steam boiler replacement and uh, staff will be returning to your board at a future date with a um, design and well with a, with a bid for a catwalk installation in the maintenance chase um, and they would assist us in that construction all of these costs are were anticipated in the project budget and and they're all covered in the in the budget um, The um, total total project of the uh, total cost of, of the South Placer Adult Correctional Facility is, is 105.5 million. Funding for Banner's construction management was included in the project budget, and there is sufficient funding appropriated in the project account 
for these additional services. I'd be happy to ask, answer any questions. On it, it, Rob, is this a time sensitive item? Yes. Um, we've got um, some remediation work that we'd like them to assist us with um, going on down there. This steam boiler replacement, obviously, um, the catwalk, and then and then the final commissioning of the security, security electronics system. Are they going to walk off the job if we don't take this up today? Uh, actually, they haven't. We, we have been doing a lot of the warranty work on our own, our, with our own staff, and they have not been on site. So this is picking up kind of where they left off to finalize the commissioning and um, close out the documentation for the, for the construction uh, closeout. Thank you. Any other comments from board members? Is there anyone in the audience who wishes to address the board on this item? Seeing none, what is the pleasure of the board? Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve item 7B, South Placer Adult Correction Facility Project number 4764. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you, Rob. Thank you, and, and um, believe me, we are taking some lessons learned away from this. Thank you. <clears throat> now we will move to item 7C, Midwestern Placer Regional Sewer Project State Revolving Fund Assistance Application. <clears throat> Mr. Zimmerman. Good morning, Chairman Holmes, members of the board. Bill Zimmerman, Deputy Director with Facility Services have Dave Atkinson with me this morning and what we'd like to do is give you a quick update on the Midwestern Placer Regional Sewer Project and from there we have three specific requests for your board that are required by the state revolving fund and are needed to finalize our, our um, financing application package. The requests we have for you this morning are number one pursuant to the county's role as a responsible agency to adopt a resolution approving the environmental impact report and mitigation monitoring and reporting plan for the Midwestern Placer Regional Sewer Project. Our second request is to adopt a pledged revenue and funds resolution dedicating net revenues received by Sewer Maintenance District 1 for payment of any and all clean water state revolving fund financing assistance for the regional project. And lastly, to adopt a resolution of intention to comply with Treasury Regulation Section 1.150-2 and SRF requirements regarding reimbursement of capital expenditures incurred prior to execution of an SRF financing assistance agreement for the regional project. And an important consideration to keep in mind as we work through this discussion is that the City of Lincoln is the lead agency for the project. They're the agency that prepared the EIR the Lincoln City Council certified the EIR. Uh, the county is a responsible agency by fact of our using the EIR certified by Lincoln for our financing application package. In terms of project, uh, our project update, back in August of 2012, your board approved the design and environmental review agreement with the city of Lincoln for the regional project. We've been working very diligently with Lincoln staff and their consultants since that time and just wanted to highlight some of the progress that we've made. In terms of environmental review, again, City of Lincoln as lead agency prepared the EIR. It was certified by the Lincoln City Council on May 28, 2013, and the following day Lincoln filed a notice of determination on that certification. We continue to work with uh, Lincoln staff and their consultants on the permitting that's needed from a number of state and federal agencies, and we are currently on schedule to have that work completed by September 30th, which is our deadline to have our SRF financing application package submitted to the SRF. Project design for the regional project is complete. The City of Lincoln is bidding it as three separate projects, one for the pump station at SMD1, one for the regional pipeline, and a third project for the wastewater treatment plant expansion at the City of Lincoln. And you can see the bid dates up there. We'll be opening bids later this month and in early September. And at that point in time, we'll have more definitive information for you on uh, the overall cost of the project. This next slide shows the pipeline alignment, and you can see the pink area in the upper right-hand corner is Sewer Maintenance District 1. 
The pipeline starts at the treatment plant on Jurger Road, follows Jurger down towards Mount Vernon, and at about uh, Baxter Grade Road follows a cross-country alignment down to Chili Hill Road and then on to Virginia Town Road, uh, ultimately through the Turkey Creek subdivision where it connects to the existing pipeline in Highway 193 and then on to the city of Lincoln. Construction operations agreement. Sorry, I'm a page behind. Um, two pages behind. We continue to meet uh, regularly with Lincoln and their uh, consultants. We're putting together the terms and conditions of the construction operations agreement, and that will be consistent with the original Lincoln offer, as well as the deal points that were approved by uh, your board back in August of 2012. We're on schedule to wrap that up and have that document ready for presentation to the Lincoln City Council on September 10th and then back to your board for final approval on uh, September 24th. All of the work that we've been doing is going to play into our SRF financing application, the environmental impact report. That will be part of the documentation um, along with the construction operations agreement and then uh, fees in place uh, for the debt repayment. Our current financing terms through the SRF are a 30-year term at 1.9% interest uh, with $6 million of principal forgiveness. And if we do not have our application submitted by that September 30th deadline, uh, we do run the risk of, of losing our principal forgiveness. Um, at this point in time, a lot of work's been done. We do have work left to do in a short amount of time to get it done, but we are on schedule as we sit here today. And the actions that we have for you this morning are the next steps in that process. Uh, at this point, I'm going to turn things over to Dave and let him uh, walk you through our specific requests. Mr. Chair, members of the board, in this part of the presentation, I'll be providing some information on the three actions that we're asking your board to take this morning regarding the regional project. The first action has to do with the environmental impact report that the City of Lincoln prepared <coughs> for the regional project. SRF guidance requires that each loan applicant, even if they're not the lead agency, be required to approve the project CEQA documents, and that's one of the actions we're going to ask of your board this morning. The design and environmental review agreement between the county and the city of Lincoln designated the city of Lincoln as the lead agency and the county as a responsible agency for CEQA purposes for the regional project. Additionally, the DIRA specified that the environmental review and analysis that Lincoln conducted would also, not, would also include the city of Auburn's portion of the project as well as the county portion of the project. This additional work for the city of Auburn for the environmental work was done at an additional cost of $153,000. With the full understanding of the timeline and time constraints for the project, Lincoln and its, Lincoln and its consultants expeditiously executed the CEQA process that resulted in the preparation and certification of the final environmental impact report, um, which is this rather large binder right here. Um, listed on the slide here are the milestones that the city of Lincoln and its consultants uh, met, and this process provided multiple opportunities for public input during the process. These efforts culminated in the city of Lincoln's city council holding a public meeting on May 28th, 2013, where they considered public comment and then adopted a resolution in which they certified the environmental impact report, made findings concerning the mitigation measures, adopted the mitigation monitoring and reporting program, and approved the Midwestern Placer Regional Sewer Project. In certifying the final EIR, the City of Lincoln found, quote, that all of the potential significant adverse environmental impacts of the proposed regional project will be reduced to less than significant by the implementation of the proposed mitigation measures and none of the alternative alter alternatives to the proposed regional project can feasibly substantially further lessen or avoid the potentially significant impacts. A copy of the city resolution is included in your board package as attachment A. As Bill mentioned earlier in the presentation, the following day on May 29th, the City of Lincoln filed a notice of determination, and a copy of that is also provided in your board packet as attachment B. 
The mitigation monitoring and reporting plan that uh, accompanies the EIR covers a number of project mitigations in areas relating to many aspects of the regional project. Our staff report included several examples of these mitigation measures and a full inventory of the mitigation measures can be found in the final EIR which was made available to your board and was also made available to the public at the clerk of the board's office. In addition to the action relating to the EIR, there are also two other actions we're asking your board to consider this morning in relationship to the regional sewer project and our SRF requirements. Uh, the first is your board's adoption of a pledge of revenue and funds resolution. Uh, the pledge, the pledge revenues and funds included include revenue from SMD1 monthly sewer service charges, connection fees, and reserve balances. In the event of a shortfall in service, service charges and connection fees, the use of SMD1 reserve funds would be available for debt repayment. The second resolution is your board's adoption of a reimbursement resolution. The resolution indicates the intent of SMD1 to comply with Treasury Regulations 1.150-2 regarding the issuance of tax-exempt obligations. Essentially, the main purpose of this code is to ensure that the funds used to reimburse the project expenses will comply with the tax exempt bond requirements from the funds where they were the bonds were the funds generated uh, this resolution is an official declaration by your board of our intention to reimburse the expenditure with proceeds from a borrowing and a statement of the nature of the expenditure essentially that we're going to use the SRF loan proceeds to repay project expenses from the regional sewer project the attached resolution complies with the SRF and Treasury code requirements so to recap, the three actions we're asking your board to take this today are, first, to adopt a resolution approving the final environmental impact report and mitigation monitoring and reporting plan for the regional project as a responsible agency. If approved, your board's action today on this item will authorize staff to make necessary environmental determination findings and other actions as may be, may be necessary or advisable to meet SRF requirements. Secondly, adopt a pledged revenue and funds rev resolution dedicating net revenues received by sewer maintenance district number one for repayment of any and all clean water state revolving fund financing assistance for the regional sewer project. And third, adopt a resolution of intent to comply with Treasury reg Regulation 1.150-2 and SRF requirements regarding reimbursement of capital expenditures incurred prior to execution of an SRF financing assistance agreement for the regional project. In addition to county staff, Bernadette Beasy from Stantec, the project environmental consultant, is in the board chambers today, and we're all available to answer your questions. Questions from board members? Supervisor Euler. Question <clears throat> less with uh, the items we're being asked to consider, but more just project in general. Just kind of how's it going in terms of uh, time frame, cost, um, where do we sit in terms of right away, all that kind of stuff at this point? I'll start off by saying it's a lot of work. We've accomplished a lot of work in a short amount of time, and we still have some things left to do and a really tight time frame to get them done. Um, that said, we are working together very cooperatively, very productively, and we're currently on schedule to meet all of our milestones and have the project deliverable in the time frame that we said we would have it deliverable in. Um, as we've worked through the project, there have been cost issues that come, have come up. Uh, you may recall that the original offer included a $7 million um, payment to Lincoln for oversizing in their system that Lincoln then pledged back to the project as contingency. Based on the 90% cost estimates that we got as part of the final design, that $7 million is now down to about $4 million. As we've worked through the project, there have been other issues that have come up, cost issues um, that we're looking at and talking our way through and, and hopefully are on track to have those resolved. What kind of other cost issues? Um, for example, there, uh, there is an issue with um, paying DPW cost of inspection in the county road rights-of-way. Most of this project is located in the county right-of-way. 
Um, similar projects that we've done for other sewer districts, that's a legitimate cost that has been uh, paid by the district to the county for those services for inspection and testing and those types of things. That has been an issue that's been brought up on this project. Um, some of the other ones are design costs associating with complying with SRF requirements. Um, that's, we received a, to back up a little bit, we received a letter from the city of Lincoln last week requesting additional compensation for a number of different issues. Uh, that is one of them. But what would you, uh, I'm sorry, clarify that for me. What, it, what, what's the issue there? SRS has a number of requirements in terms of reporting, auditing, things like that. Their right. normal, uh, their normal relationship would be with an agency that it's not only the owner of the project, but the designer and the builder and the operator. Uh, we have a unique relationship here with uh, how things are structured between the county and the city of Lincoln. Uh, in discussions with SRF, there were some additional requirements that they felt needed to be passed through uh, to the city of Lincoln to make sure that their obligations and requirements are being met. And so we're working our way through with the city of Lincoln on how to best address those. Uh, things like records uh, retention, auditing, additional reporting requirements that we have with the SRF. And so uh, Lincoln is uh, at least requesting that we look at uh, adding to the capital charge to cover some of those, uh, what they feel were unanticipated costs uh, as part of their offer. Another component of that request was some demolition costs at uh, Sewer Maintenance District 1, uh, the, the Plant 1, um, having to do with demolition of the clarifiers which are large concrete structures in the ground that were originally scheduled or intended to be used for emergency storage. Um, Lincoln is now proposing that final design includes uh, an emergency storage basin that provides all of the emergency storage so those clarifiers are no longer part of that solution. Okay. So they would like extra money for the demolition of those. Um, there is also the issue of lining the emergency storage basin. They've asked for additional compensation for that. Their original concept was that those would be lined with on-site soils. So th those are some of the highlights that are in, in their request. Again, we got that late last week. We're still in the process of working our way through it and coming up with a recommendation on it. I don't have that for you today, but we're giving it a good hard look. Okay. So just kind of taking them in order in in terms of the inspection fees that public works would charge for the work being done uh, in the road right of way and as it affects the surface of the road that's something that we would charge to anybody else doing any other project if a developer those are costs that we paid for the Applegate project for example those are costs that we will pay for the SMD three okay. regional sewer project okay. is there any reason why uh, Lincoln had an expectation that that wouldn't be a cost associated with this project the position they've put forth is that basically the that would be the county paying the county and that's a cost that the county would absorb. Okay. And the position that I certainly put forth when Lincoln was standing here saying this is their project was that this is their project, that they have to pay the costs associated with the construction of this project. And if that's a county cost that we charge for even on our own projects, then that's a county cost that we charge. Agree completely. So I don't understand that one. Um, the second item that you raised, um, which I'm forgetting right now in order. What was it was it? the SRF requirement. Thank you. The SRF requirement. Um, the, this is for obtaining the SRF uh, uh, principal forgiveness? It's for the, the, the financing in total, including the principal okay. forgiveness. It's not exclusive. Which was, to which was absolutely unequivocally a requirement of that project moving forward. There's not a single board member, I would hope, that would have voted for this project absent the F SRF funds being available for this project. And so compliance with that absolutely unequivocally was a requirement of our board moving forward with this project. I don't know how anybody could wonder whether or not there were, number one, going to be costs associated with compliance, and number two, the, whether this project would have to bear those costs. I, I don't understand how this is even in question. 
I guess in response, I would say we haven't had, I, I tend to agree with you, I haven't had the opportunity yet. My staff hasn't to go through and really look at the request and understand it. Okay. And then provide you a recommendation today as to whether I completely agree or completely disagree. Okay. And then uh, as it relates, I mean, obviously I'd be curious to see what happens when we open bids. Um, as it relates to right-of-way acquisition, easement purchases, and all the rest, where do we stand in that process? Because that's always been my biggest concern is that's the part that will tie us up and really screw up the schedule and probably costs. Where are we with that? The majority of the pipeline is located in county roadway rights-of-way. Right. For the cross-country portions of the alignment, Lincoln has secured options for those easements, all of the easements. They're in the process of executing those. Um, part of the request that we got from Lincoln is to move money from the $73 million deal into the design and environmental review agreement cost, which was about $6 million, in order to pay for those the, the cost of those easements. So it was a cost that was included in the back end of the project that they're now asking to move up into the front end so that they can cash flow those purchases. Okay, but ultimately it remains within the total project scope and cost? You're correct. Okay. So it's just a timing standpoint? Correct. Okay. Thank you. Supervisor, uh, my game. Uh, might be constructive just to offer up that I don't disagree with any of your concerns, Kirk, on the cost side of the issue. But I just want to add one thing that might be a little bit helpful. I have had one conversation with a council member in Lincoln with regards to the public works inspection cost issue, and I think part of the issue is there may be alternative ways to deliver the same level of uh, guarantee to the county as to those inspections, and they, I think, want to just broach those kinds of things. But I don't disagree with uh, your perception of the cost and our understanding uh, as to any of the comments that you made. Supervisor Grant. Yeah, Bill. Um, any uh, At this juncture, you, you, how long ago did you receive the correspondence from uh, City of Lincoln? We received the initial letter. I believe it was last Thursday. It was They gave us um, a second letter revising the request okay. on Monday. Okay. Yesterday. Yesterday. Okay. So we haven't had a, a, an opportunity to fully vet um, what those requests are. Correct. Sure. Okay. Do you foresee... Uh, Looking at your crystal ball, do you foresee, for whatever reason, uh, inability to negotiate through these at this juncture? I think we'll be able to, to work our way through this. Okay. Thank you. Robert, did you? Uh, no. oh. Supervisor Montgomery. Yeah, I wanted to um, reiterate what Robert said in response to the issues that Kirk raised. Um, I absolutely agree. Um, I think these are basic expectations on the county fees and basic expectations on the process costs associated with the SRF loan. Kirk's absolutely right. <clears throat> My intention in voting for the project was that Lincoln would cover those costs, and so I think it's very important that, you know, while we may be looking at alternative delivery models um, in terms of the county fees, it is absolutely my expectation that that was part of the um, firm offer that Lincoln brought to us as a county that we voted on. Uh, back on slide three, the environmental permitting on schedule to be completed. Is there any hiccups in the environmental, uh, any concerns about uh, any agency that may provide a little? In terms of the environmental permitting, um, no real hiccups that we foresee, but it just it is a lot of, of work that's outside of our control. We're relying on federal agencies, state agencies to provide us with the letters that we need in the time frame that we need them. So everything, it, we're on schedule, but it's out of our control. Okay. So that if we didn't get that permitting process finished by September 30th, that would jeopardize our application to the SRL? It would jeopardize our ability to get the $6 million in principal yeah. forgiveness. All right. Thank you. Uh, any other questions from board members? Is there anyone in the audience who wishes to address the board on this item? Seeing none, we'll bring it back for closure. Move approval of item 7C, 1, 2, and 3. Second. It's moved and seconded to approve item 7C, Midwestern. Plaster Regional Sewer Project State Revolving Fund Assistance Application. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. 
The motion is passed. Thank you. I voted no. Now we'll move to item eight. Health and Human Services, Adult System of Care Proclamation. Ms. Falman, I can use a little mental health. hearings, we'd be coming back to you today to ask you to approve a proclamation to proclaim September 2013 as Mental Health, Alcohol, and Drug Addiction Recovery Month in Placer County. Just a few comments. The impact of untreated mental illness and substance use is significant in Placer County, as it is everywhere in our nation. Uh, we would estimate that 6 percent, or 21,000, of our Placer residents are diagnosed annually with a mental health issue and have consequences as a result of that issue, hopefully getting into our great services and our contracted services, but also having some impacts, impacts as a result of that disease. Alcohol abuse is also estimated to affect 32 percent of our population. Um, again, with impacts, uh, treatment options, but lots of impacts related to alcohol use and abuse in our community. The very good news I'm bringing to you this morning, though, is that treatment works and people do recover. Uh, recovery is a process of change through which individuals improve their health and wellness, learn to live self-directed lives, and strive to reach their full potential. In Placer County, many, many people are living productive, satisfying lives as a result of recovery from a mental health condition and or alcohol and drug dependence. Recovery Month is a national celebration held each September as a reminder that treatment works and recovery does happen. In Placer County, we'll be celebrating Recovery Happens, an annual event at, um, on September 21st at the Auburn Recreation District Park. It'll be an event that will occur from 10 until 2, and we'll have community-based organizations, community partners, the Mental Health, Alcohol, and Drug Board, Placer County staff, and many, many people in recovery and their supporters that will be in attendance. The national theme this year is Join the Voices for Recovery Together on the Pathway to Wellness emphasizing the role that peer and community support play in helping people achieve wellness and live their recovery. Placer County's Recovery Happening event will promote the critical message that prevention works, treatment is effective, and people do recover. It's always best to understand the recovery process by using a person, a real person with a real story. So I would like to introduce Will Teller now. You may remember him. He's been before you once before, who's just going to share a few words about recovery. Morning. Yep. Very good. All right. There you go. Good morning. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. My name is Will Taylor. I, I've contracted with the Placer County's Adult System of Care for the last year and a half as a Consumer Affairs Coordinator. My job is to represent the voice of people with mental illness to the staff and leadership of Placer County's public mental health system. Um, I have what, what is considered a, a grave and serious mental illness. And I have both a mood disorder and a psychotic disorder, which means in layman's term, terms, I see and hear things that aren't there, and I have a lousy time when it happens. Um, nine years ago, I, I received a, an accurate diagnosis after a lifetime of struggling. And that, after um, a series of treatments, provided a, an improved, a, a constantly improved quality of life. And four years ago, um, I made the choice to stop using alcohol and drugs to both treat my symptoms and, and I, used, I used them recreationally um, as well. The, the problem with using substances for me was the alcohol aggravated my depression and substances like marijuana aggravated my hallucinations. So it was, a bad, it was basically a bad coping strategy. Um, so my, my recovery really started about four years ago when I made that choice. And recovery doesn't mean cure. It means taking my life, it took, meant taking my life back from the obstacles that had tripped me up. Um, basically, life can, can be better for people with mental illness and for people who use substances if they decide to take the, take the responsibility for their own behavior and have the hope that their lives can be better. We can, we can set goals for ourselves to have better lives, to live independently, and to contribute to our communities. Um, I want to thank you for su your support in celebrating recovery. Recovery happens and treatment works. I'm an example of that. I ask you to support our resolution. Thank you. Thank you. 
So we are asking the board, as well says, to proclaim September 2013 as Recovery Month in Placer County, demonstrating your support and commitment to mental health, alcohol, and drug treatment and recovery, and to support our local Recovery Happens events. So be happy to answer questions and recommend. What's the date of your Recovery Happens event? It is September 21st. And where's what's the location? Auburn Recreation Park right. District yeah. from 10 until 2. Alrighty, and there'll be hamburgers and hot dogs. Absolutely. All right, I'll be there. <laughs> yeah, it's free free barbecue for, for, uh, provided by our service providers. Right. Great, great event. So, do I have a motion to approve this? I'll move approval and congratulations, Paul. And second, and indeed, congratulations. And under discussion, I'll just add that knowing that recovery does happen means that. There's hope for all five of us sitting up there. <laughs> I don't know about that. Uh, treatment will be well, full. So, some of us might be too far gone. Is that <laughs> it's, it's a touch and go. Recovery is possible. Those that have served uh, almost 20 years might be too far gone. <laughs> Which in and of itself is a sign. <laughs> There's no going back on Robert's. All right. Okay, there's a motion and a second to approve the proclamation proclaiming September 2013 as mental health Alcohol and Drug Addiction Recovery Month in Placer County. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? The motion is moved. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now we'll move to item 8B, Medical, Medical Clinics Chapaday Indian Health Program. Yes, that would be me again. Okay. So um, last item that I have for you today is a two-part request. It's first to approve a contract with Chapaday Indian Health Services for medical and dental provider services from August 1st, 2013 through June 30th, 2014 for a total amount not to see, exceed $420,000 with no additional net county cost in this request. The second action is to consider approval for the option to renew this contract for up to two additional years um, if the county benefits from this option. Health and Human Services is mandated, we talked about this earlier, under Welfare and Institutions Code 17,000 to provide medical care to uninsured income eligible adults. We're also required uh, to serve through an expanded population through the Placer Medicaid Expansion Program as a condition of a contract with the Department of Health Care Services until December 31st, 2013. The medical clinic uh, serves people um, in offices in Kings Beach, Auburn, Roseville, Lincoln, and we provide this service um, to um, we provide this care, excuse me, uh, serving patients with Medi-Cal, Medicare insurance, as well as the MCE and the MCSP program. More than 13,000 men, women, and children receive primary care, women's health, pediatric care, mental health, and behavioral health care, and immunizations each year at the Placer County Medical Clinics with over 26,000 patient care visits annually. Chapaday has a qualified and licensed to provide medical services in the state of California operating, as you know, the local um, clinic in Auburn. They also have clinics in other locations. Um, and they do also serve a wide range of Placer residents. They have additional opportunities to recruit medical and dental providers and make some uh, provider time available to the county clinics. We have a similar contract as this one with the WellSpace um, clinics, formerly the effort also. So just maximizing the opportunity for staffing. This agreement enables uh, Chapaday to provide physicians and dental services to Health and Human Services for additional medical and dental staffing. These contract providers will help to meet the clinic's immediate need to provide medical and dental care and are more cost effective than permanent benefited staff. So we do anticipate that we'll need these staffing through the end of this fiscal year. It's not yet clear at that time what um, the needs will be. That's why we asked for the option because we'll be evaluating as we go forward. These expenditures are included in the department's 1314 proposed budget and are fully covered by federal and state reimbursement. Uh, no additional county general fund contribution is required. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions and recommend approval. Supervisor Duran. Yes, Marie, th thank you for bringing uh, this forward. I, I, I support uh, this uh, program. I do ha have a question, though, with regards to the um, uh, entering into additional year contracts. How do you, uh, and just real briefly, how, how do you evaluate? Do you set goals? Do you set uh, uh, milestones with, with these? Do they report to you? How, how, how does that process work? So um, in this particular case, um, it is more going to be uh, uh, evaluation of the, whether the medical clinic is going to need additional staffing support. Okay. So these are people that are actually going to be working in the medical clinic. Okay. And so it's really going to be uh, related to the operations in our state in terms of operation in a county operated program. Okay. Um, but we will be you know, evaluating the quality of the people that are in that program, just like our medical director currently 
sure. who actually works for WellSpace oversees the current um, providers. Right, and as a nonprofit, are they are they um, uh, required to apply for grants? Those kinds of things. Do you keep an eye on that, or? In this per case, in this case, it's really a local option for purchasing um, physician, uh, physicians. Okay. So we have local locum tenens contracts for physicians in other areas, and we are feeling like having a local option really is going to be to our advantage. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Any other comments from board members? Uh, Marine, do, do they have a pharmaceutical? Do they have a pharmacy at Chapade? They do. Okay. It's specifically for the people that are getting services over there, and right. so certainly they're a Medi-Cal provider and an MCE provider, so that benefits some of the Placer residents at this okay. time. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone uh, in the audience wish to address the board on this item? Seeing none, we'll bring it back to the board for approval. It's moved and seconded to approve item 8B, Medical Clinics, Chapa Day Indian Health Program. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll move now to item 9, Public Works, Award of Agreement Number 1159 to MV Transportation. Mr. Gardner. Good morning. Thank you. Um, yes, today we are recommending that you authorize the Director of Public Works to award a contract to MV Transportation to uh, uh, operate Placer County Transit's dial-a-ride service. And a little bit of background here. Um, earlier this year, uh, our department, DPW, along with the uh, Western Placer Consolidated Transportation Services Agency, which is a uh, staffed by the Placer County Transportation Planning Agency, uh, we conducted a joint procurement, um, which was led by our county procurement division. Um, along with the county's dial-a-ride program, which we're talking about today, the WPCTSA was seeking proposals to operate their Health Express program. They're different programs, but they're similar enough to go out to uh, procurement at the same time to hopefully uh, realize some economies of scale with one uh, procurement process. Um, we received proposals from four companies. The evaluation panel, which uh, represented a number of jurisdictions in, in our own departments, um, made uh, recommendations that two of the companies, Pride Industries and MV Transportation, advance to uh, interviews to evaluate them further. Um, we had a number of criteria, technical uh, as well as cost. Uh, when the evaluation panel interviewed both companies and did the initial evaluations of the proposals, cost was not part of what, uh, what was evaluated. In fact, the uh, evaluation panel doesn't know the cost at that point. So we're mere, uh, purely looking at the technical aspects of the proposals. Um, through the interview process, we learned a lot about the two companies that, that – um, uh, were the lead proposals, and after the interviews, uh, we just, uh, Pride Industries was actually recommended as the highest scoring proposer. Um, however, the cost proposals from both companies were vastly different. MV Transportation offered a proposal that was initially 35 percent less in cost than Pride Industries did. So we felt uh, both WCTS, WPCTSA and our department believed that it was worth going on to do further negotiations with both companies. And there were some other items on the technical aspects of their proposals that we also needed clarification on that were related to cost in some ways. Um, so we negotiated with both Pride Industries and MV Transportation. Pride was able to bring their price down moderately uh, if both contracts were awarded concurrently, that being Placer Counties and the CTSA's contracts. Um, with MV, we needed some clarification on their personnel and organizational proposal. Basically, we had some concerns that their staffing was going to be too thin uh, in the case of somebody becoming ill. They, they had a very uh, thinly staffed uh, supervision proposal. Um, they agreed with us, and they went back and looked at that, and they came back with a uh, a better, uh, in our estimation, a better supervision and management support program for our dial a -ride operation and the Health Express program combined. With that, however, it did increase their cost by 8 percent. Still, however, that left, left a vast difference in the two cost proposals. But at that point, we were looking at two proposals that were now comparable in terms of uh, how they would be able to carry out uh, the services. 
And with that, um, it, it ends up being that the final result it was that MV's cost ended up being 27% lower than Pride Industries. Uh, MV is a, is a large nationwide company. They do public transit service all over the country. And here in Placer County, they operate Roseville Transit for the city of Roseville. They also operate our, our joint call center, which is a combined effort of all the jurisdictions that operate transit in Placer County. They also contract with us in Tahoe to provide seasonal drivers. Uh, we have no doubt that, that MV has the capabilities of doing the program, and they are able to take advantage of a lot of cost savings because of their resources that they have in the area. So um, they're, they're going to be able to basically offer us at little or no cost some of their management services that will oversee the day-to-day -day operations of our dial-a-ride services. Um, so with that, the recommendation is to adopt a resolution authorizing the Director of Public Works to execute with County Council and Risk Management Review and Approval Agreement Number 1159 with MV Transportation Incorporated for provision of Placer County Dial-A-Ride transit services for a three-year period with the rates offered by MV Transportation as noted in the staff report and also to authorize the Director of Public Works to approve agreement change orders up to 5% in any one year of that three-year period. Um, and I'm uh, certainly happy to answer any questions about the report. Supervisor Euler? I'm just curious, um, in both of the um, uh, proposals, the responses that we got, um, it looks like the year two cost is actually lower than the year one cost. Why was that? Uh, particularly for MV, this, they had a lot of new startup costs in year one, and um, so it does drop down. I, I apologize. Prides was not. My yep. apologies. Theirs did go up. Okay. Okay. So it was just MVs. Their their year two operation was reflective just primarily of operations, and some of the startup costs right. are gone at that point. Okay. Yep. All right. Thank you. Any other comments from board members? Anyone in the audience wish to address the board on this item? Uh, Mr. Chair, I'm sorry. I, I did want to recognize that David Melko from WCTSA is here. Also, Derek Calhoun from MV Transportation and Roberta Collins are here also uh, uh, to represent MV Transportation. All right. Good. Thanks for hanging around. Yeah. <laughs> All righty. Uh, is there a motion? It's been moved and seconded, I think, uh, to approve uh, item 9A award of agreement number 1159 to MB Transportation. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And the motion is moved. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now we'll move to item 9B Snow Creek SEZ Restoration Construction. Contract number 1157. Hold item uh, agenda item 9b and this is to adopt a resolution authorizing the chair to execute construction contract 1157 with Burdick excavation company in the amount of one million four hundred and sixty three thousand nine hundred and sixteen thousand dollars for construction of the Snow Creek restoration project and there is no net county cost um, this recommendation for award is based on the lowest responsive bid by Burdick Excavation, ensuring County Council and Risk Management review and appro approval. We're requesting the board to also authorize the Director of Public Works to execute con contract change orders if necessary up to 10% of the contract amount. We received a total of four bids on the project, ranging from 1.46 million for the lowest bid to a high bid of 1.7 million. And the lowest responsible and responsive bidder was about 270,000 below my engineer's estimate for the project. Um, fiscally, this construction contract is fully funded by a compilation of federal, state, and local grants. Funds are available in this year's Department of Public Works budget. Environmental uh, work, CEQA and NEPA um, approvals have been made. So 
Just wanted to give a, a quick summary background, but this is one of the more unique projects that we have up in Tahoe. And I think the name is a bit of a misnomer, but this is the restoration of the old TNT cement batch plant that's at the edge of National Avenue on the edge of the Snow Creek wetlands. And um, I was real excited to see Jim Branham earlier this morning because this project um, was the very first grant that the Sierra Nevada Conservancy awarded to Placer County, mm -hmm. if not the very first grant that Jim gave out. So they gave us, uh, Department of Public Works, $1.8 million to purchase this property site. So um, when I first started this project in 2003, we studied the upper portion of the watershed and the problems that I noticed in this upper portion. We had stormwater, right-of-way water that was flowing into a roadside ditch, kind of disappeared into this culvert, and the culvert went under this cement batch plant. So the treatment of the, the Placer County stormwater was inextricably connected to the restoration of this site. Um, the, the purpose of this project, we're going to remove the fill that was placed into the wetlands by the, the cement batch plant over the years. Uh, we're going to connect some open space with a class one bike trail. We're going to relocate um, most of the impervious surfaces in the commercial floor area to land uses that are more capable of supporting that development. Uh, we've also incorporated some lead concepts from the American Public Works Institute for um, LID or low impact development of public infrastructure projects. And this, of course, is an EIP, an environmental improvement project through TRPA. And we are going to get a TMDL credit for that, for the removal of the, per of the pollutants at this property. So um, any questions? Uh, sounds like a good, good project. Supervisor Wagner. Uh Just a great presentation and would love to see uh, uh, on a tour when we're up there sometime the project as it uh, goes through it. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Supervisor McDermott. Yeah, Kansas, thank you so much for just bird dogging this through the process. It's been a very long time coming. I'm not sure any of us ever believed that it would come to fruition. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to see this in front of us, and I think it's particularly important in light of the conversations we had with Lahant and about our, you know, meeting that TMDL um, and making sure that we continue to have a permit up there so that we can continue to both develop and redevelop where appropriate in the, in the basin while achieving better lake clarity. So honestly, thank you so much. I'm just absolutely tickled pink to have this in front of us. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. We're not done yet. Uh, anyone in the audience wish to address the board on this item? Seeing none, we'll bring it back to the board for action. Move approval. It's moved and seconded to approve item 9B, Snow Creek SEZ Restoration Construction Contract Number 1157. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Now you may go. Thank Great. you. <laughs> Where? Judy, this is item 10. Sheriff's Department automatic, Automated Fixed and Mobile Identification Fund. Thank you, Chairman Holmes, members of the board. The item before you today requests your approval of the two-year spending plan for RAN, known as the Remote Access Network. The funds for this were authorized in a 2007 resolution whereby we collect one to two dollars on the vehicle registrations in the Placer County area. The regional law enforcement partners use this to enhance their fingerprint identification activities. The seven-member board met last month and approved this spending plan, which is before you today for your consideration. Welcome any questions you have. Any questions, Supervisor Montgomery? Oh, so. I'm sorry. Darn button. See no questions from board members. Anybody in the audience? Uh, no? Okay. What's the pleasure of the board? Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve item 10A. Automatic Fix and Mobile Identification Fund. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you. Thanks for hanging out. Thank you. All right. That concludes the uh, this session. Yeah, the board will now adjourn to closed session to uh, discuss one item of existing litigation, the motions to intervene in the FERC proceedings regarding pg e and NID. And the board will then adjourn as the Board of Supervisors and convene as the 
Placer County In-Home Supportive Services Public Authority to discuss labor negotiations with its negoti management negotiating team.
need to get some new technology. You ready? Uh, the board has returned from closed session where they uh, discuss the items listed on page five on the existing litigation motion to intervene. The FERC proceedings, the uh, board heard a report from their staff and gave direction. Uh, the board then adjourned as a board and convened as a Placer County in-home supportive services public authority and heard a report from their labor negotiations team and gave direction to that team. That concludes the closed session report.